Hey everybody, welcome to the Asian Boss Podcast. I'm your host Stephen Park and the following is a conversation with Yunmi Park. Yunmi is a North Korean defector, author, and a human rights activist advocating for women's rights against sexual slavery. Now, we've interviewed a lot of North Korean defectors in the past, but what makes Yunmi's story quite interesting is the fact that she's been living in the US for quite some time and has this unique perspective on all the latest social changes and cultural shifts that are taking place in America. So without further ado, let's dive right in. This is a conversation with Yunmi Park, and you're listening to the Asian Boss Podcast. So Yunmi, uh, it's a pleasure to finally be able to sit down for a chat with you. You know, I've obviously known about you for a long time from your viral video, your speech, uh, which was like crazy impactful. And I think you really speak for uh, a lot of North Korean defectors that are, you know, there are quite a few number of them out there by now. It's really great to be able to sit down and you know, have you share your perspective of, let's say, having lived in, in the U.S. for a while um, with our audience. So welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored. <laughs> I'm a yeah. huge fan, actually. I've been following you guys for many years now. Oh, really? So very, okay. Yeah, it's very surreal for me to be talking to Asian boss. <laughs> well, yeah. that's very flattering because you we know for a fact that you know you're friends with you know people like Jordan Peterson and you've also been on Joe Rogan. Compared to them, we're like tiny, so you just have so much to share, and you know in your relatively short. I guess lifespan, you know, you just we just went through so much. So for those who are still not too familiar with who you are, especially those in Asia, how would you typically introduce yourself? Oh, I guess I am a North Korean defector and now I have devoted my life for freedom in North Korea and of course worldwide. Um there Many North Korean defectors like me who have escaped but didn't have the chance to come to freedom. Still, about 300,000 of them in China are trapped, and most of them are human trafficked and sold as sex slaves. So, I've been dedicating my life to let the world know that there is a modern day Holocaust happening inside North Korea, in China, under the Communist parties, and the world is. It's our responsibility to stop it. Because I've been following your work, uh, you've been repeating this message quite a bit. Do you feel like your message is resonating? Because I know you've spoken with a lot of powerful people. You pretty much have a megaphone at this point. Yet, do you feel like a, a meaningful progress is being made? Or is it just something that people talk about that they're like, yeah, nothing really gets done? So that's a great question. Like I had a chance to meet the most, I mean, uh, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. I've been mean, spoke at Google, Facebook, I mean, anywhere you can think of, right? All the tech companies and a lot of uh, companies and the United Nations State Department, the TED conference mm -hmm. and all these platforms. I've been sharing my story and to try to be the voice for the Northern people. The reason why there hasn't been any international global movement has been happening to support nursing people is because everybody is afraid of China and especially the Chinese Communist Party. Even in America, this is the most powerful country with economic power, for sure. Even in America, the American elite, in some sense, the American mainstream, the tech companies, and even Samsung in South Korea, uh, I recently got canceled by Samsung Ele Electronics in America. The reason they couldn't bring me as a speaker is that they have $2 billion investment in China. And they cannot go support the message of all activists who is denouncing China's Communist Party's sponsorship on North Korean dictatorship. The people haven't under understood this, that the only reason that North Korea has been this way and the Kim Jong-un can't stay in power for this long is because of Chinese Communist Party has been sponsoring him, giving him the oil, giving him the money and all the resources to maintain the, po like the power. If China stops sponsoring Kim Jong-un just for one week, the regime is going to collapse. 
So the accountability is on the shoulders of Chinese Communist Party. And it's mainstream of America or the world is too afraid to challenge China on this department because China is the second world like global power right now. Mm. I guess uh, we are starting off on a pretty explosive note uh, here. <laughs> so let's uh, get into that a little bit later. So mm. at this point, it's fair to characterize you as a uh, human rights activist. Would you say mm -hmm. that's fair? Yep, for sure. That's, yeah, that's what I devoted my life for. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So well, let's talk about how you became to be such a strong advocate for human rights, especially for women's rights, uh, you know, against sexual slavery or tra sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, you are a North Korean defector. And, mm -hmm. you know, when was it that you first... Uh, escaped from North Korea. How many years ago was that? Uh, I escaped North Korea when I was 13 years old in mm. 2007. I was very hungry and we couldn't find any more food in North Korea. And at night time, I was seeing this light coming from Chinese side. Luckily, I was living on the border of North Korea, the town called Hesan. Mm. And that's when I thought if I go where the lights were, I could find a bottle of rice. Mm. And that simple promise made me to escape from North Korea. Yeah. So during that period, uh, was that like the sort of the great famine uh, type of fate where a lot of people actually starved to death? So that's when I was actually born. North Korea, uh, when I was born, it was October 1993. Mm. And uh, Official record called the Great Famine or the Arduous March began from 1995 to 1998 for three mm. years period. And that's because coinciding with the Soviet Union collapse, mm. 1989, 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they couldn't support North Korea anymore. And the regime could not get all this aid from Soviet Union. So they decided to starve certain caste class of North Koreans. So in North Korea, we have total 51 different songbun, like caste system. Mm. Depending on your caste system, the regime decides who gets fed and who gets starved. And if you are not on the high ranking that caste system, then majority people are going to be outside of capital Pyongyang. And those people got starved and died millions in the 90s from starvation. And that's how I was seeing dead bodies every day on the street as a toddler just walking in my town. Mm -hmm. You know, by now, I guess what Asian boss is sort of known for is we have interviewed quite a few uh, North Korean defectors. So at least I'm reasonably familiar with uh, what actually happened. And I mean, it still doesn't, you know, it still it never ceased to amaze me how many people actually died and how many people struggle. And we're talking about some serious you know, life and death type of situation uh, and, and struggles there. But I think your story is actually probably one of the worst <laughs> in terms of the, the stuff that you had to go through because, you know, let's sort of skip to the part and, and you know, like your actual struggle and the journey is well documented in your first book, uh, which I highly recommend that people read. But then I think what's, Probably the mo more most extreme for you is that when you when you cross the border and manage to escape, that's when effectively your your real hardship uh, started, right? Yeah. It, when it comes, so maybe you can just walk us through what happened uh, when you decided to escape, the journey, and then what happened. So we can cover that in details as well. Yeah, so a lot of North Koreans do escape, and I was one of them. And when I was 13 years old, I crossed the frozen river with my mother. And as soon as I got to the Chinese side, the Yellow River, the frozen river, uh, first thing, obviously, that I was seeing was my mom being raped right in front of me. And then these people were, you know, like checking our bodies and our teeth and everywhere, turning us around and negotiating our price right in front of our eyes. And they told us that because of the one child policy in, in China, they come, like implementation of one child policy, 
there are more than 33 million men in China cannot find wives. Mm. So they demand these North Korean girls as sex, their sex slaves. But actually being a sex slave, you just said like, oh, actually my stories are one of the most horrible or maybe there is not. Mm. When you mm. end up in China as a North Korean woman, you end up four different places. Number one is organ harvesting. They buy these girls and boys and people, and they take the organs out and just kill them, discard their bodies. And no, there's no accountability. Nobody's going to look for them because nobody knows who we are. We are fugitives. Second place we end up is brothers. They buy these girls and they drug them and they rape them and until they die. Usually they don't last until four even six months. Third place they end up is a, a village of men who are so poor. They cannot find the wives. So they collect the money and then buy one girl and rape her around the town with a gang raping her. Another possibility of getting both these towns are brothers or cousins to share the one girl. So how I ended up was being bought by a one human trafficker is actually in some ways the most light uh, case you can imagine. And this is how 90% of North Korean defector women, when they escape to China, they face this kind of uh, situation. Mm. So uh, we just want to kind of make it clear. So when you cross mm. the river, like you said, yeah. it was frozen. So you could literally just walk over the river, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then who was sort of like meeting you on the other end? Were those the traffickers or like like the Chinese people? Like who are there to, to greet you there? <laughs> it's it's interesting. So North Korean border is not like normal borders. You can just cross. Because oh, right, every right. 10 meters, there's a border guards with the machine guns. Mm. They have shoot to kill order. So if they right, see right. somebody crossing, they're going to shoot you right on the spot. Luckily, uh, my sister who escaped right before me a few days prior, she left me a note saying, oh, why don't you go find this person? She will help you to escape to China and come mm. find me. So that's so called a broker, right? That's a broker. Yeah. So that lady uh, found some young men who escorted us to cross that river. But that person, I think, drive the border guard. So that's why we were able to walk across the frozen Gobi there. I mean, the river. Right, right. So you're met with the guard who mm. knew you were coming, right? We didn't see the guard directly, but they knew. And uh, this young man who broke her guy like took us mm. and crossed the river with us so when we got to chinese side of the river bank that's where the brokers chinese brokers were waiting to buy us from north korean broker right and but did you know that at the time like when you were being greeted by these uh traffickers like what was the first thing that was going through your mind so this is the thing about the price of you paying being born in North Korea. North Korea is a supposedly a socialist paradise. On TV, they don't have anything bad things happening. The news is all about how our revolution is winning, how everything, the factories are producing amazing things, you know, how our mother nation is always victorious. So, and then of course, there's no internet. We don't even know the existence of the internet. There are no independent news channels to inform people what's happening in the world. And at school, I never even had a sex education. We don't even like learn men and women can kiss. So we, I didn't even have the vocabulary of human trafficking or broker or even rape. I did not know any of that. I was just seeing something so horrifying. And my mother was asking me, like, turn around and cover your ears. The she was getting raped just in front of me and I I was frozen. And once that was over, they told us that we had to be sold if we really wanna be in China. And they said is that's what's the most sad part is that they said if you don't wanna be sold in China, you can go back to North Korea, they said. Going back to North Korea meant death. And I still remember there's a one thing that made me not wanna go back. In this broker house, um, in the kitchen, there's a something called a like ground trash can there. And up until the moment, like I never seen a trash can. Like in North Korea, 
we had nothing to throw away. Mm. You know, everything, even with like our hair, we had to use that like cooking thing to, you know, start a fire. Nothing in our family we could afford to throw away. And China, they had something called trash can where you can throw stuff that you don't need. Mm-hmm. And that's why I thought maybe China was a much better country than North Korea. Being raped and being sold for North Korean people at least is better than being starved to death in North Korea. So most of women choose that path. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that sounds so horrible. And, and, you know, I really admire the fact that you've gotten to the point now where you can actually talk about these things. Uh, but I'm sure at the time you're totally traumatized. But then, like, what happened after that? So your mother got raped. And did they try to touch you as well? or They didn't because my mom was there. Right. And uh, they sold us separately. They sold my mom for $65 at the time in 2007. And they sold me for just above $200 because I was virgin and I was a child. And somehow child virginity is very valuable for these perverted traffickers. Right. So they would charge more money for me. And I got separate from my mother. But when you are keep selling to next human trafficker, your price goes up. So this is the thing. This is a human trafficker wing, right? The North Korean broker sells us to Chinese news broker at the border. Border trafficker sells us to the inner side of broker in the inner Chinese land, mainland. And then they are that keep selling us different traffickers that our price keep goes up and mm. they decide either sells to organ traffickers or do, do they sell to brokers or do they sell us to a farmer, supposedly a Chinese farmer husband who's going to rape us. Mm-hmm. And by the third human trafficker, uh, we landed. That's, I was going to kill myself. I couldn't take anymore. Like that guy was trying to rape me, obviously. And I was going to kill myself. And he offered that if I become his mistress, he was going to help me bring my family to me. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, if I sacrificed myself at the time, I could have sold my family. So, but he was a trafficker that sold my mom to a Chinese farmer. So he knew where my mom was. So I became his mistress and he bought my mom back from the farmer that he sold to. Right, right. So pretty much on day one, you had to be separated from your mom or you guys were sort of like moved together? Within two days, I think. First right. day, they sold us to a different trafficker. Right, right. And by that second trafficker, they sold my mom first and kept me. And I saw my mom for like, I didn't see my mom for three months. Oh, wow. I, I'm trying to put myself in that shoe, in, in your shoes. And, you know, obviously just this whole situation doesn't even make sense. But like, you know, when you're sort of at the whim of this trafficker, but then it almost like creates the perception that because there must be a lot of like single farmers out there, Chinese farmers, because like you said, it's, it's the, the one child policy, they need women, but are they the, the willing participant? Because, you know, a part of me want to believe that there are some like innocent farmers out there whose job, you know, he's not trying to actively like rape women, right? But how, did, how does that relationship work between the farmers and these traffickers? Those farmers, they know that North Korean women are fugitives, right? Oh, right we right. do not yeah. get recognized as human beings by Chinese Communist Party. They, we are hiding from police. So the most common thing I remember from Chinese people telling us that, oh, you are less valuable than the pig that I have at home. Because even if I kill you, you can, of course, go to police and report on me. And even if I kill you or do anything to you, there's nobody going to come save you. So North Korean women have less rights than their dogs, their, their animals, livestock. Right. And when you buy these women, it's, you bought with your money. And, of course, this, a lot of farmers... The reason they couldn't find the wives, of course, like there were most of the girls who were, a lot of girls who were aborted. And mm. so not enough women. But then also these men are having issues. 
they have mental issues, they have physical disability, and uh, things are not normal. That's why they couldn't get married in the first place. So when this disabled uh, gambling, drug, like gangsters, this kind of man, very, I guess, how do, how do you put this kind of people, right? Mm. They, when they buy these women, no women going to be willing to be raped by this man. So they beat these women and torture them and they use, you know, cigarette like lights and torture them and they beat them and they give them force to give them drugs. And these women try to run away. So they make sure like these are puppies almost in chain. They have no even right to go to the bathroom by themselves. It's the most undignified experience you can imagine. That's how they treat these women. So it's not like these farmers are like normal human beings, just simply cannot find wives. Mm. A lot of them having mo- many, many issues. And that's why they couldn't find normal wife in the first place. Mm-hmm. And so these traffickers, knowing mm-hmm. that there's this like a, I guess, you know, in a weird way, a market demand for these type yeah. of things, are they hiding these things from the, the Chinese government? Because like, is the Chinese government aware of these type of things that are happening? Because I understand that, you know, at a governmental level, North Korea and China must have some sort of a cooperative relationship so that Sorry. like, what what is the, the official protocol? Like, you know, right. from the government's perspective, do they know that these women are being sold uh, as slaves? Absolutely. Uh, North Korea and China has this agreement that where if North Koreans escape to China, China needs to catch them and send them back to North Korea. Right. Even though that is directly goes against international uh, human rights agreement, the Geneva Convention. The North Koreans are not just migrants. We are polit- political refugees, right? Why am I a defector? I'm not a North Korean refugee because when North Koreans escape, that means we defy the regime. Mm. That's how North Korea, we betray the ideology of this Communist Party. So when we escape, we are we we are deserve to be protected by international law. Nobody can send the refugees back to their country if they are going to be persecuted politically to a prison camp and torture and rape and public execution. And that's what North Koreans are subjected to. But Chinese Communist Party, they do not expect, respect international law. And they catch us, they send us back. It's like catching a Jewish person in Nazi Germany and sending them to gas chamber. You know, like Anna Frank, those kind of cases that what history has been repeating is repeating for North Korean people. Mm-hmm. But among those officials, what's so sad about this is that one of the person that uh, a girl that, that this Chinese broker sold to was a top uh, official in the police department. They themselves buy North Korean girls as their mistresses right? and hide them in their secret homes as right. their wife. So the government directive is that you're supposed to send them back. But then with the, the whole trafficking, the whole idea is to almost like treat them as a cattle and then you pass them around within China, which means that it is sort of like not aligned with what the government is trying to do in other words all these like police chief you mentioned are they going against the government directive no no no. if you see them you should send them back so that was a until a few years ago law but china decided recently to switch the law where okay now we're gonna keep these girls instead because oh. they are afraid of rebellion from chinese men if all their life works so hard and they cannot find the wives they're not going to be happy with the system. And that's what Chinese regime of this during the pandemic, we saw how many people were not happy with the government, where they were going out protesting against the lockdown. So because of that, China determined this time, okay, we are not going to send these girls to back North Korea. However, they have no right in China. They only have to be staying with the person who bought them as a slave. And they have no right to move around within China. They cannot get the ID. They cannot get a job. They just can be only sex slave to the man who bought her. So they changed this uh, regulation for a few years ago. So China decided to keep North Korean girls as sex slaves in their country. Mm. But during your time, which was quite a while ago, 
uh, that was catching that, and sending back. Right. But that means there must have been like a, a little bit of corruption at the local level uh, where they were, you know what? Yeah, it doesn't matter what the government say. Let's just buy and sell them. Uh, and so that's what happened to you, which was like, you know, it's like a little mini black hole that nobody knew was happening. No knew. The United Nations knew. There was a huge report called the Lives for Sale that right, came out right. in 2007 and before 2002. And... U.S. government knew, or the organizations knew, the U.N. knew. Mm -hmm. The only thing is they just chose to not do anything about it. And now, because of the factors like myself and survivors coming out of this modern-day slavery, and now talking about it more publicly, because a lot of North Korean women cannot even talk about it in South Korea, mm -hmm. because South Korea, as you know, you live there, very conservative society. If you say that I've been raped when I was 13 years old, not normal same family gonna welcome you as a daughter-in-law mm -hmm. so a lot of survivors witnesses going to south korea they still cannot talk about their experiences unlike the comfort women mm -hmm. during the japanese era we had the comfort women when the war ended those women went back and they could not talk about their experience because because yeah. you get publicly they were blaming, shamed yeah, yeah yeah they were blaming the victims and i think that culture still presides in south korea and that's why not enough uh, survivors are coming out and campaigning against the CP right now. Mm -hmm. So when you were effectively captured uh, by these traffickers and you be had to become one of their mistresses, you're only 13 at the time, yeah. right? Did you, did you try to run away? Is that impossible? I tried, but then where do you go? you might get captured by worse traffic and they can just take my organs out and carry me there. So there is really no option for us. And also the thing is, North Koreans are so isolated that we don't know there's a world like Australia, that free country exists. And there is a country, South Korea, that is so prosperous and would accept us as citizens. We don't have this information. Mm. We, even though when we go to China, we still don't know what internet is. And I mean, these traffickers don't even let us go to the bathroom freely. They're not going to give us like internet and phone and things to show us what, what's up in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so North Koreans, a lot of times, they have no clue how life can be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it is. They don't know the alternative life is possible. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them just enslaved because they don't know what can be possible. Mm -hmm. So then at that point, uh, when you escape for freedom but you really don't end up having any freedom at all and somehow end up in a little like a worse situation yeah. because now your your body is getting violated did you have any kind of regret at that point it's like oh man what maybe i should have just stayed back in north korea or did you just were you still kind of glad that you did escape so that's the thing um i was not escaping from north korea for freedom because i did not even know what freedom was mm. In North Korea, we don't have a vocabulary for freedom or human rights. It's not a concept, right? The people are so oppressed to the point they don't give us this vocabulary to describe our situation. The only reason I escaped was because I was starving. Mm. And hunger means death in North Korea. If you don't eat, you're going to die, right? We need the energy to survive. So if I didn't escape, I would be dead at 13. You would not see me right now. And that's the tragic part of being a North Korean is even this, the worst thing that as a sex slave was better than dying from starvation. Yeah, that's why North Korean women go to China and be trafficked, not because they want it, because if they don't go to China, they're going to die from starvation. Mm -hmm. So were you at least being fed properly uh, in China? No, I mean, uh, there are times, these people who buy North Koreans are not rich people in China. Mm. So a lot of them couldn't even afford the rice. You know, in America, oh. people are watching out there like carbs and don't eat white rice. It shocks me to this day. Right. Because <laughs> that's all North Koreans want. He was eating some rice and, and some kimchi, I guess, maximum. But these people um, don't have a lot of things a lot of times. And they make us to as, as a work slave in the farm too, not only as a sex slave, we mm. have to work for them like 20 hours a day in the farm for them. Wow. I guess to uh, 
uh, put things in perspective a little bit because I'm trying to figure out a, a, any kind of like a counter argument and maybe uh, you know some of your critics might say oh you know you're describing what used to happen like you know 10 years ago or yeah. you know, 15 years ago but you know right now situations are different so for example one probably one one of the noticeable difference even as to the reason why a lot of North Koreans once try to escape North Korea is because they now want the freedom as opposed to they, they don't have to face that, that extreme starvation, at least in 2023, at least based on my understanding. Uh, so maybe they'll say, oh, you know, it's horrible that Yummy went through all this tragedy back in like how many years ago, but possibly things couldn't be that bad right now. What would you say to those people? So that's the thing. When it comes to North Korea, even when you are in North Korea, you are isolated on purpose, right? Because there's no freedom of movement between people. And uh, between the caste system, we are not like allowed to go to Pyongyang if we want to go see Pyongyang. People need a travel permit to travel within North Korea. That's how North Koreans are so isolated from each other. So one biggest fallacy that North Koreans have and I had to learn, I actually studied North Korean subjects. I mean, I've been studying every report I can get, any book I can get to my hands to till this day studying very much because, because we were isolated for, for purpose. If we knew what's going on in our country, we could start revolution. And a lot of North Koreans, when they come out, I made the same mistake. Because you had a year certain experience, they generalize it. Mm -hmm. They think that's how all North Korea is. And there's no way that's how North Korea is. There are so many different pockets and fit from one different class system. There's no way everybody's one person's experience can represent all of it. And actually, uh, I've been, I'm on the board of Human Rights Foundation and we just recently sponsored a movie that won the Sundance in America. It's called the Utopia, Escaping from Utopia. Mm -hmm. It is about following a journey of North Korean family who just escaped last year from North mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. And I would love to send you the link. And it's, uh, I think I still have a, a brokers in North Korea, not those human trafficker brokers, but information brokers I work with in North Korea. The reason why people, there's no massive escaping happening is after Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-un really understood that North Korean de facto became a threat to his regime. Because now we've been talking about human rights abuses if that's happening. And Kim Jong-un cannot not, terrorizing people because that's how he control people using terror using public execution as a tool to control the population and he cannot let all these political prisoners go away right that's his tool use, using brutality to control the population so he decided to not let anybody escape so the the border guards rules had changed he buried landmines on the North, North Korean Yalu River that like just general border. So entire North Korea became a prison, political prison camp. And used to be the border guards with the machine guns, I said so, but he's been changing them constantly so these people cannot become corrupt by the local like it, uh, brokers. So you're describing like the exact situation like right now in 2023 that there are now landmines and then it doesn't matter if you try to bribe somebody, it doesn't even work because like as a system, they kind of change the whole thing. Even with the 80 grand, $80,000 in the USD cannot rescue a North Korean person right now. Oh, wow. Well, before, but it was possible with that kind of money. Before $2,000 was possible, even like a $5,500 uh, was possible. Right, right. It's not about North Korea became a utopia inside. Actually, during the pandemic, what do you think happened? North Korea cannot have international trade. And even us, our economy heavily affected by that. Not all the industries, but in North Korea, they cannot, they don't have enough farmland or fertilizers to make the enough food for people. During the pandemic, actually it got so dire that some of the cannibalism that happened in the 90s came back for the North Korean people. So that's true. Like after even my escape, the gap between the North Korean elite and the general population got bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, the rich got richer, poor got poorer. 
that's true. So a lot of richer people in North Korea became a lot more luxurious than before. But that doesn't mean the remaining population became that way. And the remaining population became way more oppressed and isolated than Kim Jong-il's time or Kim Il-sung's time. Mm. In some way, by under the Kim Jong-un, it became unimaginable. And that's why people are not escaping. Not because they don't want to, they just they can't anymore. Isn't it also part of the reason why they completely shut down the border? And I am also familiar with how they completely shut it down uh, is because they didn't want the, to get the COVID or, or pandemic uh, to happen in North Korea as well. Before to... the pandemic, he buried the landmines oh, and put really? the electro. Okay. And not only that, the security on Chinese side also went really up. So because of AI uh, technology, facial recognition, and it's funny in America, the Trump talking about the building wall, wall right near mm -hmm. the southern border. Mm -hmm. And North Korea and China did a long time ago. Mm -hmm. North Korean borders, if you just look at in picture of Haitan right now, mm -hmm. or wire fenced, entire border is sealed. Mm -hmm. Whole country is sealed with the wire fences right now. And Chinese side also has electrified wire fences. On top of that, they put the uh, facial recognition AI camera there. So they can even notice at night who's crossing, who's not. Wow. So Chinese border got secure. And this is before happened, the pandemic. It happened after Kim Jong-un came to power like 10 years ago. And it's been just keep getting insane, insane. And now rescuing one person out of North Korea became almost impossible work. That's why we don't see more new fresh defectors anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard that, that it's like these days you don't really hear about any more defectors, but that's why this is one of the reasons. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. I see. So I guess to kind of go back to your situation in China. So then how do you kind of get out of that situation, knowing that that's where you might end up for the rest of your life? What, what were you what were you thinking? Uh, were you sort of planning some stuff where you might think, oh, there's there must be a way for me to get out of this? So when we were in China for two years, I did not even know that getting out of China was an option. Mm -hmm. And one day at the end of the two years of time in China, we met a fellow North Korean defector woman. And she told us that there are missionaries from South Korea are rescuing North Koreans. And if we go join them and do the Bible study with them, they will help us to go to escape from China to Mongolia, then go to South Korea and become free. So that's when I was 15 years old. Uh, we met these Christian missionaries in, in China, in Qingdao, and we studied the Bible for like almost two months. And then by February 20, 2009, it was the coldest month in the Gobi Desert. They told us, they gave us one compass in our hand. Why don't you go follow the north and west direction and cross eight wire fences. And if you survive the desert and if you don't get killed by the guards, and if you do find somebody in the desert, tell them that you're a refugee and you want to go to South Korea. And that's what we did. How do you go from being almost like kept as a, as a prisoner to being able to like go on a desert? Like how do you end up in Qingdao, for example? So we were in Shenyang. And the missionaries told us to uh, take a bus to come to Qingdao. Oh, and okay. back then, China did not have like facial recognition cameras and their security was not as tight. Nowadays, we do like a social credit system and facial recognition. You cannot even get on the bus without ID. But that was 2009. So China was not as bad of the police state that they are right now. So we were able to get on the public transportation which was bus. So we took a bus from Shenyang to Qingdao. And after we dropped off from the bus station, the one of the missionary lady met us there and took us this called safe home, like shelter home, mm -hmm. like it's hidden from other people. And there we met other North Korean defectors and we would be praying and studying Bible every day for weeks. Mm -hmm. And did your... Uh... Uh, owner or your husband did he allow you to leave how can you just take a bus uh and just go play go to places he became a uh, very addicted to gambling so oh. he lost everything the time when he had to when he had me and after more than a year of like owning me 
that's the thing. Like nobody is pure evil. <laughs> nobody is pure angel, right? Humanity is a very complex thing. He didn't let me go. He didn't let me go because he could not even uh, feed me. He he became so poor. He got completely broke from gambling. So he didn't let my mom and myself go. And from him, we initially had to go find a place to live. And where do we go? Like you cannot get even job as a washing dishes. I remember going to restaurants and begging them, like I can wash dishes. Can I get a job? And they like, they can't because I'm a, I don't have a Chinese that who cards called ID. So we met a North Korean, another lady that you can go do something called chat room. Mm. And this is the, what's other options? They go into actual prostitution. So this is the chat room is where they give us apartment and they give us food. And for the price of giving us shelter, we have to show our bodies through the uh, webcam cameras. Oh, I see. And, but that was the safest thing I could get in China. So we right. were, while we were working in this chat room, we met the fellow North Korean defector woman, and she was the one introducing us to the missionary. So in some sense, that worked out. And at that point, do you sort of think to yourself, man, what, what the hell happened to my life? I go from being a slave to now being forced to work in effectively what is a prostitution, yeah. you know, being a webcam girl. Uh, like, you know, how are you able to process their reality at, at such a young age? Well, I think that's the thing. When I came to America writing my first book, uh, my editor in New York City told me, you mean to go see a therapist? You're traumatized, right? And I was like, what is a trauma? What is PTSD? What is therapy? It's a, not a concept for North Koreans who are surviving life. You know, if you can even think about the time to think about how hard your life is, you are really not in a bad situation. When you are surviving each second of your life, you don't think about those things. It's very choosing life and trying to survive is a very instinctive thing. You don't have time to reflect. Like any second, the Chinese authorities can come in and catch me. Even me walking to the grocery store, somebody can see me and report on me and catch me to send me back to North Korea. So even after two years of living there, you still had to kind of look behind your back to see there could be like some sort of a government people trying to take you away and then uh, send you back to North Korea. You still had that fear. It's not only government people. So during America, right, the, when America had a slavery, it was a law. Remember, there was a slave hunters. If the slaves yeah, yeah, run yeah. away, you go catch them and you get money. Oh, so wow. Chinese did the same thing. The Chinese government said, if you discover North Korean defector and report on them, we're going to give you money. And that was the money amount was almost equal amount of the um, year salary for North Korea, Chinese uh, worker. It's like significant amount of money that you right. get rewarded if you detect a North Korean defector. So it wasn't just we were watching out, just police. Everybody, any child, anybody on the store, street, can be a person, can de deport us, right? Mm. So we, even breathing was painful in China. It's, uh, I, I was dreaming, how can I become invisible? So I don't get caught by these people. You know, that's all you think about as a North Korean factor. We don't have time to, but for me, what happened to me is like that. It's like, how am I going to survive? How am I going to hide from these people? Mm -hmm. And your mother was in, in, a, in a similar situation? She was with me going through the exact same journey, yeah. Then you met the South Korean missionaries and they uh, told you about, oh, you could actually end up going to South Korea. Did you think it was possible? And I mean, you just talked about crossing the desert and you could literally freeze to, freeze to death. You just, you just had to do it or somebody was like guiding you? Was there like no. a big group of people? It's too dangerous for somebody to guide us, right? Because in the desert, they also had the shoot to kill order from Chinese and Mongolian side. So both guards see us, they can shoot us and kill us. And there's really many wild animals in the Gobi Desert. And then also, most of all, it's February in 2009. It's minus 40 degrees at night in the desert. Right. Right. It's very, very cold. Nobody would kill us. We could just die from the cold. And they put us in a group of uh, eight people, but one of them is a toddler, three years old toddler boy. 
and we had his father who was a man and remaining is all girl women because most of the factors are women mm. so we uh they gave us a compass and we asked i think what are the chances of making this work and they said don't think that like if god wants to rescue he will rescue just believe in god's plan so that's what we did we just believe in a miracle and that's how we embarked that journey and how long did that journey take so it took one day because they we were able to go all the way to inner mongolia that's china has right different states like mm-hmm. america and inner mongolia is still part of china so we are able to take the train and bus to inner mongolia and from inner mongolia to mongolia that's the gobi desert mm. so we uh started the night before around 7 p.m or 5 p.m and then we got called the next day mm. during the day uh in the morning time by the mongolian guards wow and then what happened when you met the mongolian guards <sighs> it's they were trying to send us back to china and to send us to north korea and when North Koreans escaped, like, you know, Jewish people when they were fleeing Holocaust, we, we know getting caught is worse than getting killed. The best thing can happen to us in that scenario is us killing our lives as quickly as possible before we go through all that torture and unimaginable things. So we were trying to kill ourselves in front of these Mongolian guards, and they stopped in the last minute, and they contacted the South Korean embassy, and they... South Korean embassy came and took us to a shelter or a detention center. But we learned that later, the soldiers were doing that to just have fun, to see how we would react. And they did that with the next team that crossed the desert from, and one of the lady was my mom's friend. And they pr- was pranking, right? Prank. Mm. And one of the lady had swallowed all the poison that she brought. Because they were really like, like you know, teasing these people with their lives. Right. And eventually, two months later, though, they still helped us to go to South Korea. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I know your story, but to still hear about it, the you know, just from directly from your mouth is still. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just so crazy. It just it just defies logic how something like this actually is still happening, presumably, uh, in twenty twenty three. So when you talked about the poison pill, is that something that you could just buy? And then like, what's your intention? Like, oh, if I get caught, I have to swallow this thing immediately or? So we had a lot of, uh, this is when it was Joe Rogan. I was saying I had a laser and he thought I had like laser, razor. Like, you know, very, very thin, thin, like razor razor knife. Yeah, 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 razors. So we hide them around our jacket, like sleeves. So Mm -hmm. we can like cut our arm, like our neck. And then uh, in China, it's, they are not like America, very strict with the prescription pills. Mm. So you can buy just like many, many sleeping pills. Mm. And then you can just swallow like you know, a handful of them. And even taking one going to knock you out for two days. So if you take like hundreds of them, it's, even you can cure a cow with that amount. Mm. So we uh, hide the pills, we hide the razors, and some people hiding uh North Korea has a lot of a drug, as you know, right? They sell yeah, a lot yeah, of drug, yeah. drug trafficking. So a lot of them bring like huge opium or huge chunk of like meth, something can totally overdose you and kill you. So, mm-hmm. but we didn't do that because we were living in China for two years and mm-hmm. we didn't have any drugs. So we bought tons of sleeping pills instead. And you're, you're totally ready to use it if, if, cause you knew that getting captured would be the end pretty much. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them do commit suicide too because in the desert, uh, we are lucky we, we got caught that quickly, but a lot of them go in a circle. The no. hardest part of being in the desert, I don't know if you've been to desert, that no. No. Like you have no clue if you, like in the middle of the ocean, think about it. Right, right. You don't have a compass and then you don't know if you're going straight or going back or going right. circle or like right. what are you doing? Yeah. And a lot of them wandering the desert for like a week. Have you ever seen the movie Crossing? Mm-hmm. That's Tai and Pyo, he did that. That boy, his son crossing the desert and dies. Yeah, It's very common uh, that. So now nobody escapes from Mongolia. The path is too dangerous. But a lot of them, a lot of them just have to end the life in the middle because there's no chance of getting discovered by 
humanity nearby. So when you got finally sent to South Korea, and mm -hmm. you know, I guess this is sort of the part where a lot of it's not good part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of defectors share similar stories of, of you know getting like complete culture shock and and mm. things are just so different you have to get you know retrained in a capitalistic society by doing this sort of like a training program in, in the yeah. government facility and everything how do you go from uh, being in south korea to mm. to going to america uh, can i be 100% honest <laughs> sure sure so I'm sure you know that like you met a lot of defectors and you do hear their uh, struggle with the adjustment in South Korea. Yes, absolutely. even though we yeah. even though we are the same people, even though we are same speak the same language, slightly different accent, but yes. still basically the same language. There's a huge discrimination, prejudice mm. against North Korean defectors. And it was very hard. Mm. I remember uh, going to South Korea. Of course, I could not admit what I went through in China. Like not, there's nobody who would like sympathize with me and telling me to go get a counseling. Mm. You know, I was still like 15 years old, younger. And if I told my middle school, high school classmates that I was a sex slave, I'd be like called like complete outcast. Nobody would even be friends with me and treat me like a human. Mm. So South Korea life was also very hard because as you know, we are academically are so behind. And when North Koreans come to South Korea, usually they don't have any idea what internet is, what you know, Big Bang or evolutionary theories or world history is. We don't know any of that. And not to mention English. It's a very important language skill to have in South Korea. We had to start with studying alphabet and taking GED to compete with the South Korean students. Mm. And so moving to America in some way, that's when I really feel like I became liberated in some way mm. from South Korea I was safe physically but I think emotionally I was still very much oppressed mm. Mm. and I think coming to America was even though I spoke totally broke English to everybody don't know the manners but I think people emotionally they are used to accepting people who have different backgrounds because this is an immigrant country right mm. like Americans are used to someone speaking like bad English and South Koreans as soon as you make one little mistake, they make fun of you. <laughs> and I think that's a big contrast. And so when you were having a tough time uh, adjusting mm. to South Korean, like, like you, were your mother with you still at that point? No. So I came uh, when I was almost turning 16 years old, like South Korean age is 17. And that's yeah. the time you go to high school. Yeah. And uh, my literally education level was not even like seven years old. I could not do English there. I couldn't do any math. I couldn't do anything. So they were asking me to go to second grade elementary school to study with the little kids. <laughs> and I was thinking, so then I'm going to be like 20 something, eight years old graduating from high school, right? right Almost right. 30 years old. And I was like, right. a lot of North Koreans do that, actually. I was like, yeah, no yeah, way yeah. I can do that. Yeah. So I chose to go to the factor school, mm. you know, the alternative, they are not good, something called in uh, Cheonan and Seoul. So I went there to study uh, for GED. So I did a GED for middle school and high school. And then I went to university when I was 17 years old in international age. Mm. So two years later, I went to university. Mm. And at that point, did it ever occur to you that, oh, you know, South Korea, I feel now at least physically safe, but, uh, you know, and I'm sure that now you have access to information pretty much from all over the world. So maybe it is possible for me to go to other countries, not necessarily America, but, you know, is that something you wanted to do or you just wanted to stay in South Korea? So back then, like, even in order to study uh, abroad, you mm. need money, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I was like, poor South Korean since who were like living in a ghosty one, like had no windows underground, you know, paying yeah. like, Less it's than $300. Super tiny rent. space like, where you super... literally have a bed and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I didn't even have my own bathroom. We had like public, like, yeah, shared yeah. baths, like underground stuff. And I didn't think that I could go anywhere. I knew that we had a passport. We were mm. free to go. But then I just was a new immigrant to South Korea and trying studying in university. 
I don't have spare money on getting a visa and getting、mm. a ticket to go somewhere. So it didn't occur to me. But also, I did have some defector friends who were going to Britain. They go as a tourist and then they stay and then stay there as illegal.、Mm. Some defectors did it to Canada, to the UK. And I was thinking back then, like, if you cannot adjust to South Korea, you are not gonna be able to adjust to other countries. Right. So my goal was like not giving up. Like, let me fully adjust to South Korea, and then think about something else afterwards. But it was never a plan for me to even imagine learning English and coming to America and becoming American citizen. I never thought that was possible. So how did that actually happen then? It's an accident. It's a. I was a junior. I was、mm. studying at Dongguk University at a Gyeongchal Eng Jong Akka. It's like a criminal justice. Oh, really? Completely okay, yeah, from yeah. fear. Yeah. Yeah, and then I was like studying criminology and police history, different subject. And then,、uh, you know, Joseph Kim, another North Korean defector who gave us a speech about what to be. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So he one day called me like, "There is a conference called One Young World. They're looking for defectors to participate because it's a Something called the Youth Leaders,、uh, almost Olympic. Like all the youth comes participate yeah, yeah. in this conference,、yeah. and they wanted to bring North Koreans. So、mm. they called the North Korean embassy in London. Hey, can you send a two delegation from North Korea? And the North Korean team said, "Okay, we need to send three because、mm. they need to spy on each other, right?" <laughs> and then one young girl said, "Like, yeah, we cannot sponsor three. Can we? Can we sponsor two and you sponsor one?" And North Korean regime, like the London embassy, said no. So they decide to bring defectors instead because、mm. we were a lot cheaper. They could just bring one, and they said North Korea were participating in this too. Right, right. So I and Joseph said, "You can go there for free. They're gonna get you a ticket and hotel room." And by then, I like never been to Europe, right? Yeah, so yeah. I was like, "Okay, this is the only chance I can go to Europe." And I still did not know Ireland was not part of the UK. I still thought I was like <laughs> somehow it's all the same thing. And I saw online that there was a you can apply to become a delegate speaker. Right. They were picking thirty six delegate speakers that year, and so I was applied. And then after interviews and test,、uh, they selected me, and they gave me a five minutes time slot to make a speech. So that I'm sure the speech was、yep. the one that you saw and. Changed my、yeah. life forever. It, it literally changed your life, and、uh, yeah, yeah, that that was super impactful. And you are also、uh, dressed in a traditional、uh, Korean outfit, right? Yeah, they were making sure all the delegates would be wearing their traditional outfit. It's so funny. So many people saying I purposefully brought my national dress and to set that off. I'm like, it was a one year old guideline. Because they try to be more inclusive with the international culture.、Right. So if you see a whole one where the people with Africa with like feathers, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> so they told me you should bring your national dress to give a speech. Yeah. So that's how I think people saw me in the handbook for the first time. Yeah, and then what was the reception like after that、uh, incredible speech? I mean, you must have been a rock star <laughs> after that, right? I was. I just turned twenty one years old. Yeah. I was junior year in university in South Korea, and I wasn't still had to go back to my classes after that week. And then nobody expected that speech to go viral like that. Nobody、yeah. predicts somebody gonna become a star, right? Like even celebrities, nobody knows. So, in some ways, an accident, or some ways, a luck. So when that speech happened, like I didn't have an agent, I didn't have anybody who were there to. Tell me what was going on. Like yeah, I yeah. don't know what New York Times is. I don't know what Penguin Random House is. Like people calling me. I'm calling from Penguin, and I was like, "Why the bird is calling me?" I did not know that was a publisher. <laughs> <laughs> and、uh. and then obviously, like I got attacked by the North Korean regime, and they would put all my relatives on the propaganda videos. I'm sure you can find still on、uh, YouTube. It's on Uri Minjokiri. Yeah. Actually, yeah, this is the part you you also mentioned in your book.、Uh, you said that、yeah. even when you were giving those speeches, they were like putting you in a like you know in a proximity with other North Korean people or something like that. Or at the, at the UN. At、uh, the UN, spoke, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because、uh, yeah. when I spoke at the UN,、uh, they thought okay, North Korea and South Korea are closer to each other, so、right. uh, they put me right next to North Korean delegation, like these three men. 
like North Korean men there with the, like their badges of Kim Jong Il and everybody right. on. And they knew and, by that point who you were and the course. speeches you're making. And so, how do you deal with that tension in the air? Like, were they making threatening remarks at you or? Yeah, I mean, they were like saying I cannot say in the broadcasting, but like horrible words in North Korean and to like you know insult me and. Mm. But not in English, obviously, because there's other nations are presenting, and I thought that was the UN really had no mind at all. Like it would put a refugee from North Korea to the United Nations, trying to kill me and capture me, yeah, and put right next to them. And it was I was horrified to go back to my hotel room by myself that night. And yeah, yeah. It was a. I was terrified. I couldn't really move, and I couldn't think. <laughs> oh man, it's. Still to this day, I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> and so, once you became that almost like a public figure, uh, you you just briefly mentioned a little bit about the the repercussion. Uh, what happened back in North Korea? What did they do exactly with your relatives? I went back to South Korea, as I said. Yeah, right? yeah. I was not planning to come to America or go yeah, to yeah, Europe, yeah. so I went back to Korea. And of course, I get the first call I get from NS NSI. The Kuk Jong Un. Right, right. They they call me like we need to meet. Yeah. So I would meet them,、mm -hmm. and they said, "Oh, you are on the killing list. So we, in order for us to protect you from now、mm -hmm. on, like we need to know what you do in every move,、mm -hmm. wherever you're gonna show, what airport, what hotel, which location, how long. So we have the people in those countries, so we can、mm -hmm. protect you. Yeah." And I was thinking, I escaped to be free, and、yeah. I know my fellow defectors who have three detectives with them all day.、Wow. They have to check their bathrooms and go wherever. And I mean, South Korea have to do that for the security reasons because they do literally send people to kill these defectors, right? So I respect for South Korean government to take those precautions. But then I was too young to be surrounded by three detectives, and then like, and not go anywhere without my own free will.、Yeah. So. I think that was really main decision for me to come to America、mm -hmm. because I consulted with the U.S.、Uh, intelligence and they said so far no North Korean defector has been ever killed in U.S. soil.、Mm -hmm. I cannot go to Mexico or Colombia or Malaysia, those countries that is to find a hit man and kill me. But right, like Kim Jong Nam got killed in Malaysia, those girls were paid for like few hundred dollars for killing him. It's so easy to buy hit man in those countries to kill somebody. So, I think that as long if I'm staying in America, I should be fine. Yeah, and and back in the North Korean uh, soil, uh, your did any did I try to do anything to your immediate family members or or relatives? And my neighbors. And your neighbors. Yes. What did what did they do to them? They mobilized them in this series of documentary North Korean production、uh, <laughs> okay. videos where.、Right. They have to denounce me that I'm paid by CIA agent, that I'm a human scum, that grew up in a like poisonous mushroom, and they say I was very ambitious girl, and my mother was a whore, my father was a, my father was somehow a mafia, drug human trafficker, and he didn't even die in China, he died in North Korea in Nampo,、mm. so we had to go. Dig my father's ashes from China to bring to South Korea. So our detective in South Korea would help us to protect him because we couldn't bury him because he didn't die in South Korea.、Mm. So we could get his DNA to prove that North Korea was lying. So after the video, you would think my life got better, but it became like ten thousand for the complicated,、mm. very hard. I,、yeah. I became, I had to become really strong afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so you came back to South Korea after that speech, and when your life is just getting more complicated by the second, because now you have the fame and you have this voice、uh, and the platform. And at that point, did you actually decide, oh, you know what, I really want to go to America now, or did that、uh, opportunity just present itself? By then, I was getting a lot of offers from publishers to write a book, and、mm. I was in South Korea, and then I until that point. When I was in my speeches, I did lie about how I was now trafficked. I said my mom, my dad protected me in China.、Mm. I never admitted about my own rape. I only talked about mom's rape,、mm. 
mm. because I still plan to live in South Korea. Mm. And that was right before Shin Dong Hyuk's uh, scandal. If you remember the a man who escaped from Pan 14, and mm. he could not come forthcoming about the fact that he reported his mother tried to escape that he got extra food and then they killed his mom and brother. And he couldn't write that in the book because of uh, the guilt that people never going to understand the choices that people have to make in the concentration camps, right? Yeah. And he was going through a huge blob after the inaccuracy in the book. Yeah. So I, I called my publisher. There was not as a hundred percent fact. Actually, there's way more to my story that I couldn't talk about this and had to lie about how I was safe in China. Mm. And I told my pro- publisher, if you don't want to write this book, I'm totally fine. I'm not going to write this book. And they send a uh, legal team and they send a writer with to, to South Korea with me. So she would have live recordings to uh, interview the people who grew up in North Korea with me. And the people who escaped that desert with me. Mm. So we would write a book based on their memory. Because mm. if we write based on my memory, I have an incentive to be biased. Mm. But if we write the book based on their memory, nobody can dispute that. Mm. So Penguin Legal Team, they're not stupid. Okay. They got all the live recordings of the witnesses and voices. Yeah. And we had to do that in South Korea because we had to find those people. Yeah. So once we got all the uh, survivors' witness interviews, we brought it back to America, and the book was published in 2015 September in America. Mm. And what was the reception like in the U.S. after the book uh, got published? So that's the thing. It's a uh, internationally it was huge success. I'm so grateful to this, how many people find it so inspiring and like you know open their eyes, but. Among the North Korean de facto communities, it was more like initial before the book. Mm. I my agent was telling me, don't defend yourself. If they go low, you stay high, you know? You don't be defensive. You don't explain what happened. Just write everything in the book. Mm. And then what I didn't realize, like nobody reads books and they love to <laughs> criticize you, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Nobody does any minimum research. They just like all have mouth and want to just like say things they saw online. Because yeah, yeah. in their mind, anything was written online got to be a fact. So it was very interesting to see how people never read a book of, like that I wrote. 100% what I like lived through with the other people's witness interview. They, they wouldn't read it. Yeah. But international community, I think they they under, they knew Marianne Bowlers who wrote the book with me. She wrote a book with Hillary Clinton and many other uh, reputable people. Mm. So they would not write a book that is not reputable. So I think in the West, it, it was a quite, uh, thankfully, a huge, huge success. And that is that is that the point where you decided to, I don't know, like go on like maybe some tour uh, in America? How did you end up going to America for the first time? Uh, so to write that book, so I had to come to America. My agent was in New York and Penguin's office in downtown. So I had to come for that. And then after the book, they do, did send me to UK, Australia, everywhere in the world to do a book tour. Mm. And I had a chance to meet everybody in the world and seeing how people really were curious about what was happening in North Korea. Even though the news doesn't talk much about North Korean people's lives and Mostly, the new cycle only is focusing on the nuclear weapon and Kim Jong Un's and dictatorship, yeah. but they don't really cover the daily life of North Korean people. But what general public is interested in is actually actual daily life mm. of North Korean people. And so I was really surprised in a good way that I had no idea how many people cared in the world mm. that they really wanted to help, and that's their motivates me why I'm continuing campaigning mm. for this. Now your new book uh, that it's 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 a very powerful book because now you have this unique perspective of being able to see from a defector's point of view what the current like American society has become, and you know because now you don't live in the fantasy anymore, you you actually see the day to day of how people interact, what the cultures are like in the U.S. But when you went there for the first time, like let's say you go to New York for the first time, mm-hmm. your your mind must be spinning. It's like how how is this possible, right? Of course, like I 
thank God or not, the first place they dropped me off was in the middle of Times Square. Wow. <laughs> I, I know you have been there. It's literally sea of lights. That's mm-hmm. what North Korea says. We are going to make America sea of lights by nuke them. Like, you know, Bulbada, like right, right, right. literally in the center of like Times Square is like totally sea of lights. Yeah. And engineering, what people can achieve, what individuals, when they are given freedom, what they can come up with is all inspiring. I was looking at Empire State Building and Liberty and I mean, everything in Manhattan is just, it shows what we can achieve. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, like what you said, like I was just, it took a while for me to really accept all of that and to, you know, fall in love with this country immediately. Mm-hmm. And then I like you going through living in this country, going to university myself and seeing other side of it too. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a full circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is part of the reason why you decided to relocate yourself to America was main thing like education? Because I know you went to Columbia, one of the, the top universities in the world. Did that cross your mind? Like, oh, I want to study in Columbia. How did that happen? Uh, why I was junior year in South Korea, right? One young word speech happened. And then I started writing a book and then I had to be writing parts of it because of the witness testimonies we had to gather. And then remaining, we had to write in America. So I come to America and meanwhile, I was writing the book. I always had that, like I was thirst for education. And because I didn't finish my BA in South Korea, Dongbuk University, Mm -hmm. I wanted to continue my education. So I asked my agent, like, oh, what school do you have in New York City mm-hmm. that I can go while I'm writing this book? There's like, oh, we have NYU or Columbia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which one do you want to go? So I chose Columbia. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, I got accepted. So I started studying there mm-hmm. from 2016 January. Yeah. And I suppose this is where the uh, the ironies of life happen because, you know, you describe your university experience. You ha- initially had that expectation. Of, oh, now I finally get to exercise my critical thinking and, and debate and, and really learn about what it means to live in freedom. Yeah. But, you know, in your book, you actually have a, uh, a very interesting experience, series of experiences. So maybe you can actually uh, walk us through that. Yeah, so, right, like, I was coming from an education system that was just propaganda, pure propaganda in North Korea. They even, they tell us that Americans are not even humans. They are cold-blooded reptiles that are trying to attack us, that Korean War began by American invasion, not by Kim Il-sung, right? Yeah. And I come to America, and the first, my orientation at Columbia is my teachers were saying, Exact same thing. The all the problems that we have in the world is because of the capitalism, and because of white men. <laughs> this and is like, in, that's in the Colombia, yeah, yeah, at Colombia, our, right? In in, yeah. in North Korea, there's all the problems. We don't have electricity because of American bastards. We don't have food because of American bastards. Because of the corrupt capitalism. And at Colombia, at Ivy League school students, they were being taught exact same material that North Korean students are learning at their school. On this side of the the planet uh, you know we hear about all these crazy like a woke culture uh that it's just going out of control uh in the west but i think most people in asia they just have no idea what that is i mean i'm pretty familiar with what that is but Mm. how do you define uh woke culture and you know how is it infiltrating uh as you know dr jordan peterson would say these university campuses where these like super smart people the elite are effectively being taught uh, these type of materials. How do you stay woke? It's a, the professors were one day asking me, like, who do you like? Who likes to read Jane Austen, the classical novelist? And I just raised my hand. I love classical books. And I said, like, I love Jane Austen. And she said, because she lived through the white colonial era mm-hmm. and she believed that somehow white men were superior than other people. And that men were only capable of logical thinking and women are not. By reading her work, you gain brainwashed to, to believe in this systemic racism and racism and like all these horrible things. So being woke means watch out. Like that's how you get brainwashed. That's how you stay woke to 
catch your own biases and the sources of oppression that you are posing to other people. Mm. Completely made up nonsense, right? <laughs> but it, that's how you would say one way of how to define work. But also another work is like, how do you be so woke to consider other people's feelings? So every class at Columbia, some survey courses, like hundreds of students go. It is not great to read or say, okay, hey, I'm from here. My name is this. I'm majoring at this. And it, at the first class, we always introduce and like this kind of introductory class. In Colombia, the first class begins with introducing your pronouns. And there are more than thousand pronouns right now. So instead of you trying to remember you as a person, I'm right. going to have to remember your pronoun. If I don't remember it correctly, I can be a bigot. And I can be threatening to you emotionally. I just want to repeat for our audience that this is at Columbia one of the top universities in an Ivy League school, the way you would think that they're producing future leaders, right? Yeah. And this is, this is what you uh, are exposed to. I mean, but to play devil's advocate, some people will say, oh yeah, but pronouns are very important. You gotta consider individuality, X, Y, Z. I'm sure that there's that side of the argument, yeah. but what, what's your take on all this, like a pronoun, the way they try to categorize like thousand different pronouns and you know things like that so this is like a, many things in the book that i mentioned that part like similarity that is happening in north korea and america that people do not understand that it's a same tactic they're using mm -hmm. so in my classroom the professors were saying math is racist it's the made up by white men to control the people of minority right because right. like math is racist now and I remember the first lesson that I learned in North Korea. My teacher was saying, what's one plus one? Mm -hmm. What do you think it is? Two, right? Mm -hmm. Any stupid person would know. My, my teacher would say in North Korea, say, no. My dear leader, Kim Jong-il, at a young age, he, he said, adding one drop of water to another drop of water, what does it become? Bigger one. It does not become two. Right. That's how my dear leader proved that math was made by white men and not a logical thing. <laughs> yeah. And exact same nonsense being at Columbia teaching us that math is racist and made by white men. I was uh, talking with my professor and saying, she said, there's no difference between men and women. Like, I can be a man. So I said, like, I have a different muscle index, muscle mass. Mm -hmm. I have an estrogen and I have a uterus and ovaries that makes eggs can reproduce. Mm -hmm. And men have testosterone. They have different you know, DNA, it's genetics, like we are different. Fundamentally, biologically, there's a difference between men and women. Mm -hmm. And she says, you are brainwashed in me. Wow. This is a live classroom where yeah. you actually say, uh, but men and women are different. And then in front of the whole class, the teacher or the lecturer would say, you're brainwashed. Yeah, you're brainwashed. What's your reaction when you hear that? It's like, am I, oh, sorry, am I, am I missing something? You cannot really have those reactions because nobody in students agree with me because they all think there's nobody, gender is fluid, right? Most of them are gender fluid and I, it's like all of them, like I'm gender fluid. And mom, at this moment, I might feel like girl, but next moment I can feel like a boy, right? That's what gender fluid means. It's a fluid thing. Like you can go back and forth every second for a million times if you want to. And they also believe that gender is made up by white men to control people. It's all white men. Behind every crime is behind white men. It's hiding behind the, with the capitalism, the evilness. And like in North Korea, every crime behind there is the American bachelors. So they, they talk about white guilt and white privilege. It's the most common they constantly talk about, you know, because you have, have white privilege, white guilt. And the reason why they should be guilty is because supposedly their ancestors 200 years ago owned the slaves. Not all of them, some of them. In North Korea, my family caste was uh, lower because my great-grandfather owned a tiny land in front of his home, and he was marked as a landlord. Hmm. Therefore, my blood was tainted because of him. Because in, in North Korea, owning, being a landowner means you're the oppressor, right? Yeah, yeah. Here, here is like the same thing. So because your ancestors owned the slaves, now your gift is called a white gift and white privilege. And that is the same tactic the North Korean regime used to divide people by into different caste system. And in America, 
they're using same thing because of your ancestors' crime. Now you're guilty and you're separate from this class. So when individuals are not responsible for their own crime, right? Like what my great grandfather has nothing to do with me. That was not the decision I made. And I was not even all alive at the time. 21st century in this developed technological America, people are playing with this dumbest idea called the white gear to white privilege right now and dividing us and making us hate each other. And I think that's what's so sad. Like they don't know how dangerous this ideology they are they're playing with, mm-hmm. where this is going to lead to. It's going to lead to North Korea eventually. We already, in American culture, like I have to censor myself a lot of times, mm-hmm. you know, especially the, during the pandemic. I had my son who was two years old. He goes to a daycare, eight hours a day, he needs to wear a mask up here, mm-hmm. eight hours a day. A two years old child who just learned how to walk. Mm-hmm. And they opened the strip clubs, they opened the night bars. The adult can go in the middle of night, drink and hang out and talk to each other. But because think, children think, cannot... Yes. Oh, I think uh, there's a whole lot of the discussion about the, the uh, ineffectiveness of the COVID policy and lockdown and then... But the thing is, the problem is that we do not we have like lack of freedom of speech in America. If you had those op- opinions was not agreeing to CDC and the federal government, they would literally go after your job. They mm-hmm. cancel you. Your YouTube channels get strikes, you get demonetized, Mm -hmm. and you get censored on social media platforms. And I think that's what I was realizing. In North Korea, the regime decides what's right and what is wrong, the party, right? If anybody disagrees with the party's idea, you get executed. Mm -hmm. In America, the American elite decides what is science, what is not, what is justice, what is not. As long as you go against political correctness, now you become a bigot, you become a racist and Nazi, and you need to be canceled. Mm. I think that's a phenomenon I'm calling. Like, we have a right to have my own like opinions. Mm. Um, that's that's why you're that's why you're there. <laughs> that's why you're there. They're no longer accepting diversity of opinions. They only want the diversity of skin color, but they don't want the diversity of thoughts. Mm. They won't mm. all of us believe the same thing like in North Korea. You one idea, one truth, one opinion. As long as you disagree with this, the political correctness, you're out. So at Columbia, uh, were you called ever called a racist or bigot or uh, just because you had had different opinions and you were just expressing them? Yeah, I was called a white passing person. Like they say, what do you know about oppression as a white passing person? Do you know what that is? What, is, what does that mean? Because supposedly I'm Asian and mm-hmm. Asians, even though we've been to internment camps, we've been both people from Vietnam. I went through actual slavery in the 21st century. Yeah. But because of Asians in America are doing pretty well compared to like African-Americans and Latinos and some other groups. Right. Therefore... I'm a white person. I can be a white person, kind of considered a white person. But so you're equally as privileged by being Asian as the white people. Therefore, you, you just I cannot... do not understand what oppression is, and I have I cannot talk about what oppression is to them. I can I'm not allowed to have an opinion about that. That's what they. That's how I shut you down. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm very familiar with uh, what you're talking about, but I think pe- like a lot of people probably listening to this uh, from Asia. They must be so confused. They must be very uh, uh, puzzled that that that's how things are. So I just want to make sure uh, that this is not just your observation, that this is actually what's really happening in America. Is this like anecdotal based on your own experiences? Because I also don't want to convey the impression that this is like everybody's like this in America. Or is it is it, at least when it comes to university uh, education? Uh, Universities are like this, most of them. That it is we like can this. agree. Right. Yeah. So especially the top Ivy League schools, Yale is the worst. Oh. The so Berkeley, you see Berkeley, pretty pretty bad. They. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Remember, they were trying to bring Ben Shapiro to give a speech in California. One of the schools they were protesting. It cost it four, I think. Hundred thousand dollars to protect his security because they were not okay with somebody 
who are having right. a different opinion to come to speak on their campus. For the benefit of our viewers, Ben Shapiro is uh, probably one of the most famous uh, political commentator, uh, conservative commentator uh, in the U.S. And he also is a founder of Daily Wire, one of the conservative media outlets. When he tries to speak uh, or gets invited to speak at a college campus, there's like a massive protest. Yeah, tons of rioting breaking through. And it's, if we do, actually, Dr. Jordan Peterson, very similar. I mean, we have seen through Joe Rogan being the biggest podcaster. Right. He had a lot of scientists, like what we we're saying about, they had questions about the how the pandemic lockdowns were not effective. Mm. And Joe Rogan, he also made some jokes with the context of certain word mm. that they were denouncing that he's a racist and bigot. And there was a huge movement trying to cancel him. And so anybody who disagrees with this elite idea of what is true, then you get become what I get and what they get. The treatment is a, it's unbelievable. So what did you exactly learn at Columbia then? Because I'm sure you're trying to study uh, <laughs> humanity and you know liberal arts and all these important subjects that is supposed to train you how to think critically and yeah. see the world in a, in a, in a different light uh, with a variety of perspectives. What exactly did you learn? This is the thing. We go there to learn stuff, right? But yeah, the thing yeah. is, point of oh i believe education is not about learning anymore it's almost make you to become their ally of this ideology called ally it's about they in the before the pro class they the professors will write these emails to us today's reading material gonna cover cover these topics mm -hmm. if it triggers you in any way don't come to the class and don't even need to tell me the reason why you're not coming to the class or don't do the reading so why are you going to university if you're not going to do them? So just because you might feel offended or your feelings get hurt, yeah. you don't actually have to attend the class. Or don't even tell me why that it offends you. Don't even give me the reason. I could totally imagine people abusing the system. It's like, oh, I don't feel like going to class today. Uh, okay, my feelings are hurt. Yeah, and then they say, oh, if you cannot handle the class by sitting through this oppressive system, bring the comfort emotion, okay. like I, emotional I, I, comfort to animals. Are, are, you, are you just making this so, or is this really happening? Like you did little, yes. the, the, the lecturer says, in this oppressive system. Yeah, it's the most oppressive state they can imagine for them. We're talking, we're talking about America right now, yeah? Yeah, it's 21st, so first century America. And for them, nothing has been more evil than this system is, the current system. Their goal is dismantling the constitution and destroying the mansion this this country so they can rebuild ideology of North Korea, the equity, where nobody is unequal, everybody is equal of outcome. And let's build that paradise. The idea that driven North Korea to become that living hell is right. driven driving same ideas driving all these people at Ivy League schools. So Literally, these kids have no even emotional capacity to handle classroom. They bring their dogs. And these dogs are something called the emotional comfort dogs. So they need to hold on to their pets to be able to handle living in Manhattan in this Ivy League school because they, okay. they were never exposed to reality. Right. And for me, justice is about what people in oppressed countries are going through. Right. And for them, justice is, do I get a bathroom for my gender like, identity that I identify with? Because now the children in Utah, actually, this is a real thing. Uh, I work with the OUR, the, another NGO in Utah. They rescue human trafficking children and women. Children in Utah schools, one day they go to, to their teachers that I identify myself as a cat. So now call me as a kitty kitty, right? Meow, meow. And I want my own bathroom because I don't identify myself as a person anymore. What, what if the teacher says, okay, stop talking nonsense. Just go do your thing. So teachers openly laughed and then like didn't take their, validate their emotions. So right. now these students were protesting to fire these teachers the, who are bigots, not accepting them and respecting their identity as cats. This is what? how far America went. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> and 
So, so why do you think this is happening? I think culturally we've been grooming narcissism as right, if right, that's right. some kind of a virtue, right? Right. Nothing matters anymore. The reality, the common sense, the logic, right. facts don't matter. Like Ben Shapiro got into so much trouble by saying, uh, facts don't care about your feelings. Which is not that particularly controversial of a thing to say. In America, it is. The most important thing is how you feel. If you feel like you're a cat, you're a cat. Right. If you feel okay. like well, you're a man, you are you're a man. If you don't feel like a, nobody, you don't feel like that. So most important thing is your feeling. It's not about objectivity. Right. There's no truth. It's my truth in America. It's like a, my truth is that I'm a man. Mm-hmm. My truth that there's no difference between genders. And I think that that kind of uh, ideology where we are teaching children, it's okay to be. I don't know. I think they were brainwashed very early on. Like I only joined from university setting. Mm. But by the time when I was joining them as a freshman in college, they were so brainwashed that I couldn't engage with them at all. But I think it had to begin way earlier on. Right, right, right. right. So like my son's like uh, classroom teach sending me these emails where how they are doing excellent job about teaching about my son Mm-hmm. about the minorities oppression and uh ex- yeah it's socialism right back then he was like two three years old so this is how only the public education system are brainwashing children be so young but america is a the the i mean the, the most successful capitalistic experiment in human history i mean capitalism is what defines the united states of america and I, it sounds to me like all these, at least from my perspective, a lot of like socialist or communist ideologies, what you would even argue far like radical leftist type of thinking is really, uh, you know, making that inroads into the mainstream uh, consciousness. The threat of like virus, any extreme is a threat to a society and right, extreme right, extreme left. The problem why the extreme left right now is a threat to our own existence in America is that because they are in control. The people who were until recently working at Twitter, the people who are working at Facebook, Google, and corporations like banks and any big institutions and universities, Ivy League schools, and even governments, they are all sympathizers of this ideology of collectivism. And they hate the free market. They hate individual like liberty. And they they don't believe in freedom of speech. They say, they literally say Colombia, speech is a violence. Speech so by, is violence. Yeah, that's their thing. Speech is a violence. It's not physically hitting you. They talk about safe space. That's the most important thing. Like we are going to have a safe space in this classroom. We are not going to allow talk about this, talk about this, right? It's not a classroom, it's not about the marketplace of ideas that we are debating what's right, what's wrong to find truth. It's mm-hmm. all about keeping this emotionally safe space where nobody gets challenged, nobody's feelings is hurt. So what happens in that environment if you do speak up? Like, I'm sure you, you, you like, oh, yeah, but that's, you know, what about, uh, I, I like to say these type of opinions. What, how do you get treated then? They say I'm brainwashed and they shut me down. The professor shuts me down. For, for real, like it's, yeah. it's, it's Yeonmi Park that the the North Korean defector who literally escaped through desert and then you are the you are the brainwashed bigot. Yeah. You're told this. Yeah, I'm the one who doesn't understand what oppression is because I'm a white passing person. It's like two North Korean telling me that I do not understand what oppression is because I'm a white passing person. So they and, are brainwashed. Right, I mean. right. So when you hear something like that, do you kind of question reality? It's like, uh, what what's going on? Am I, I mean, is this your what your idea of the American ideal was? Like, what did you think of America? I thought about America in a country where what that mattered was, a, you know, is your character, the contents of your character. It's not about, right, right. this country is a land of opportunity. It doesn't matter you're North Korean or like, African or Middle Eastern doesn't matter. You come here, you have equal human rights Mm -hmm. like other people because Mm -hmm. simply you are being a human being. And this country 
embraces different ideas, right? I think that's what the majority of the people living outside of the United States would think. Right. right. That's what they think. But they don't know what it became today. So many people that I admire, like Jordan Peterson, so he is hated to an extent that I don't think you can even imagine to the American establishment and left. And a lot of college students are one of them because he talks about this common sense. You know, what's still I think South Korean and Asian countries are not became radicalized, but I do think it's coming for them too. I think the seed has been planted. It's been brewing. And one day you will realize it's not that different there. Yeah. I've been seeing that in the UK, they at Oxford debate, union, Oxford union, I watched their debate. I've been invited to go. So my friend who went there, Michaela, actually, oh, right, Jordan right, right. Peterson's daughter, she had to go participate in debate why uh, meeting meat, eating meat is healthy because it helped her a lot of like, autoimmune system for her. And nowadays, they, because of we need to save the climate, they try to tell us to eat the bugs like North Korean people do, right? They keep saying like eating bugs, eating meat is bad for the environment. And they say drinking milk, eating eggs, eating meat is a white supremacy. Somehow, why men invented the idea of drinking milk and meat and eggs? This is the Oxford University professor who were at the union debate, debating with these facts. Yeah, part of me uh, wishes that you're all making this up, but uh, I actually know for a fact that, because <laughs> I heard that too. <laughs> yeah. But I just think that, yeah, to a lot of people, uh, when they hear this, it'll be very, very part of my language about what the fuck is happening. Yeah. Right. It's literally what the heck are you talking about? Yeah, like yeah. you are not even making any sense. Like I know I'm not making any sense. And I never knew when I come into America, thinking this is the land of the free, the home of the brave, this country stands for freedom of speech, individual liberty and like a free market. And then come here. The capitalism mm -hmm. under attack, free market is under attack, the constitution is under attack, freedom of speech is under attack. Any basic science is under attack. It's a science, but you cannot question the science. The fact that science means you can question it, right? Like otherwise a dogma is a religion. Yeah. You believe it. But the fact that we can keep testing and questioning it, that means a science, but they don't believe that. You cannot question the science. America has been losing this, I think, direction in a lot of times. And I don't think the majority rural Americans are though. I think it's mainly driven people by like the metropolitan cities like LA, Los Angeles, like Seattle. San Francisco, New York City, Washington DC in these big cities and uh, where the college campuses are. Mm -hmm. And those people going to Yale, Harvard, Stanford, they go to end up working for Facebook. They go work for a lot of top institutions and that's why they are shaping this institution in a way that their ideology, you know, aligns with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we are doing our research, you know, we hear things like, oh, you know, Yummy Park is now you know fully aligned with the 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 radical right and and you know she's become a become a uh, you know cloud chaser and you know she's now what's a cloud know, chaser you know just trying to be more popular basically by aligning with all these other popular thought leaders um how do you respond to people like that maybe those people are genuinely uncomfortable with what you're saying because this is the life they know, you know, everybody thinks that, oh, yeah, but everybody's rights should be respected and, and everybody's opinions should be respected as well. Maybe I, I'm sure there are people who genuinely believe that, right? Because that's all they know. But I agree everybody's opinions are okay. I think that's what I'm fighting for. Like, I'm yeah. not fighting for that speech is a violence. We need to shut down a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I say that we should give a platform everybody equally that they right, have right. a platform to speak their opinions and yeah. and also even some of the opinions are so horribly wrong right. we have a right to be wrong we are not in north korea we're going to execute people if you said something wrong right right except that's the, the difference from north korea right yeah. right right except the irony is the moment you actually state your opinion that might even remotely you know offend some minority groups in in lgbtq and you state your opinion about gender and all of a sudden it's like well no you can't you can't say that yeah that your right? speech is a violent now you need to shut up 
that they I have no right to speak because I offend somebody's feeling. And I think the whatever people say, those people, I think is that like what you said, in some sense, a lot of them do not have any IQ. It's just not worth of my time mm. to worrying about what those people think. But maybe some people are genuinely thinking, why is she out of nowhere commenting about American politics? Right? Because right, right, right. I was mainly staying as a North Korean human rights uh, activist and that yeah. was my life before. It happened now it was like a few years ago during the BLM, the mm-hmm. sh- looting of uh, the protest a few years yeah. ago but the America had this huge awakening where the one black yeah. man died and countries were burning down and it's a huge massive thing. I was walking down a day during a day in Chicago. I was attacked by black women. They punched me. They violently took my wallet out of me. The common sense is people are going to come help the victim. Even in crazy North Korea, if you get robbed by other people, they're going to come help me because I'm, I'm not the attacker. And then because I was trying to call the cops on these girls who were attacking me and they were black, the people who were on the street were telling me I'm a racist. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is during the during broad daylight. Were you targeted specifically? Was it something like no, random? No, we were just yeah. The, many people got targeted. Many people got getting killed. Still killed. They say in the big cities. So I was right, one right. of the girl walking in the street in the middle of the broad mainstream. Were you by yourself? I was uh, my son in a stroller with my nanny right next to me, and I was right, walking. Right. Right. But these girls were pushing me towards a corner, and then take my wallet out and trying to catch them, and they right. were punching. Me. So I was right. trying to call them on the police. And then people on the street like surround me and yelling at me that I'm a racist. And that's when I, I realized right. the insanity that I saw on college campus was spread. It was a pandemic, not the type of the pandemic we just went through, the ideology of pandemic. People cannot see the truth anymore. They're so afraid to be racist. They don't right. call out when somebody's being a criminal and attacking an innocent civilian on the street. I was like, my son is the worst. He is a half white and half Asian. Mm. It's in North Korea, the caste system, right? He got the worst caste, right? Like in America now, there's like the Olympic of oppression. Like, are you a minority? Are you a color? Are you like transgender? Like, as you keep scores, you become the biggest victim and you are a hero for us, right? It was like came to me. Now in America, I'm not safe because I cannot justice because I'm not a black. Unfortunately, I don't have the black skin color and I happen to be Asian. Mm. And people cannot see the injustice anymore because they are so afraid. They are so wise to think that somehow black people cannot become a thieves. You know, it's a anybody can become a thief. Anybody can become a rapist. It's not about your skin color. It's all about what you do as an individual. First of all, I haven't been to New York. I haven't been to Chicago. Uh, but even during that, uh, you know, maybe because of the pandemic and because of COVID, there were a lot of like, you know, uh, hate crime uh, against Asian people and where you would actually see all this video footage of people getting, you know, Asian elderly getting punched and pushed down and, you know, people die from this and somehow try to make this out to be some sort of like a white crime. But from the data, or <laughs> it's like these crimes are perpetrated by black people but then you know we saw that it was sort of linked to like a, a hate crime against asia and then there's also like a white supremacy type of thing how how is that related to white supremacy so this is the thing uh it's like as an asian woman you can when you try to take a survey it's not like south korea so fancy they have those really like guards they don't have yeah, it yeah 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 like the first thing we heard from uh, korean americans in america don't walk next to these black people or like go on the railing. They can just push you there. It's a very common thing that Asians have to watch out for. Actual statistics shows that <laughs> crime against Asian people are not committed by white people. But the mainstream media like BBC, New York Times and like Washington Post, they don't report that. They only report when some white guy goes to the salon in Atlanta and shoots people. Right. and happen to be white, then that's the only crime we have to talk about. Not millions of other crimes where this innocent grandma walks in the church and trying to go and beat up by these black guys on the streets. Like mm-hmm. me, somebody who just walks on the street and these girls, black girls are robbing me and punching me. I think this is the thing. Like it, 
there are racism and every country going to have racism. I even talked about in South Korea, I had a, like racist exactly. events like yeah, where yeah. people had a prejudice. It's okay. Every country has it. We can talk about it. We can solve it. Educate it. But it's an individual issue, not a race issue. Of course, it's not a race issue, but they racialize every instant. So when this hate crime happens, we cannot blame the black people because they are, you know, they are oppressed people. How can they do ever wrong? Right? They can never do wrong. And all because of white people. Every crime has to be the fault of white people. Even this time, there's one man died from five black uh, cops. They blame that on the white supremacy. The black cops beat him dead. Not the white cop did. And even that is a white people's crime. So everything is because of white people. Mm -hmm. And that's how stupid the ideology became, like North Korea. Like they, they don't have the black and like, you know, white, like gray area at all. And they're so brainwashed to think somehow white people can never do wrong. Mm -hmm. And they are our enemy that we need to destroy white supremacy, men, toxic like the masculinity they think that men are toxic they believe that if women were in power they would win all war all the problems that we have right now in the world from the feminist perspective is that because of men and white men especially given your background how do you process all this and then do you only see this getting worse or is there any kind of hope of you know uh, things being restored to some sense of normalcy or uh you know people kind of reverting back to common sense, at least from the outside perspective. The only one ray of hope came to me was freeing the bird, the Twitter, by Elon Musk. That <laughs> became the only mainstream social media that became free. Right, right, <laughs> Because right. I was getting shadow banned on Facebook and Twitter and the Instagram and YouTube. I was not on TikTok, but all other platforms, I was like getting censored and shadow banned and demonetized. What, what, why, why do you think you were getting censored and, and uh, demonetized and everything? Because I wrote things like, I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe in the freedom of speech. I believe in the uh, free market. And also I talked about how Chinese Communist Party has been a uh, sponsor of dictatorship and how North Korean women are going through Me Too. Remember during the Me Too in America, women come out. I went through sexual harassment. It was a big hashtag movement in America. I was making videos of North Korean women's Me Too. Why? Where this happened to us too. I got raped in China. Many other girls are being raped in China. And they demonetized that they censored that video because we are now allowed to criticize the Communist Party in China. But you guys are not in China. You guys are in America. Why? Because even look about Amazon. Most of the contributing sellers are Chinese sellers. And China is the second biggest market in the world. Any car maker, any movie maker need to sell it to China to make more money because of the economic tie that American, even Hollywood studios cannot make a movie about criticizing China. So there were times producers were trying to make my movie about my first book. I got a script. And the script says that China was my promised land. China was helping me and protecting me. I called up the producer, like, this is not what happened. And this is like actual fake news. And he said, <laughs> this is the only way we can make a movie about North Korea in Hollywood today, because you cannot criticize wow. China. That's a, that's a pretty fascinating insight, uh, especially from you. You're reading your own script of your life story and they, they change everything. Of course, they had to. And that's why you see so many Holocaust movies coming out, right? Having no problem. Hollywood has no problem making how horrible Nazi Germany was, how horrible Hitler was. But they cannot make movie about North Korean tragedy in the same way because they cannot make China mad. They need the funding. This Hollywood studios in Hollywood, they need the funding from China and they need to, to distribute the movie in China. It's a, it's a scary, we are controlled by China in many, many ways that people can't even fathom to. To even American people, they don't even under, if I haven't started the YouTube channel, I would not have known that Google was that bigoted towards people like, you know, criticizing China or like criticizing science or mainstream political correctness. If I haven't been on social media, I would not have known this reality. Or like if I was not a public speaker, I was getting canceled by Samsung Electronic. Samsung invited me to speak uh, last year 
And right two days before they called me, the head of diversity, do you know what that is? Say, say, say that again. Every corporation have to have a diversity department. So the head of diversity means they are going to make sure their company is a open to all different skin colors, people, mm-hmm. women, minority, transgender people, not about merit, not how competent you are about the job. It's like in North Korea. Mm-hmm. If you are your father, the party member and connected, you become a doctor and a party official. In America, if you are the minority, if you are a sexual minority again, and many, many things, you're a victim, then they can hire you. For, mm. This is called the diversity hiring. Right. So it's almost like a requirement that you have to meet a certain diversity requirement. They have a diversity quota. Each company, each yeah. school get a quota. And if you don't meet them, you get shamed. I guess I can try to understand the original intent or spirit behind it, because maybe by having a diversity of you know many different backgrounds and people have different thoughts so that it the best idea rises to the top, which is, I think, meant to be the original spirit. But it's almost like becoming that, uh, you know, paying lip service to, to, to the whole idea. And now the, the, the irony is that you get many different skin colors, but everybody says the same thing. So there is no diversity of opinions right? or, or best ideas, but it's like a skin color. So we actually, we even ourselves had a, I was just talking to my team about this, you know, because we get hate mails. And remember, we are based in, in Seoul, South Korea. I don't know if people, a lot of people know about South Korea, but it's all Koreans pretty much. Right. You know, <laughs> sure, maybe, you know, a few foreigners. But then we would get emails like, oh, you guys are not hiring black people oh in Korea. Gosh. So so you're racist. We, we get messages like that. I'm like, uh, seriously, like this whole idea of having a quota, even even. OK, so take it to the example of like, oh, you got to have a certain ratio of male to female. Right. It's like, but ultimately we need to get the best people, best talent. Right. Yeah. Totally. And so like, you know, pretty much like our superstars in our team, they're all women, but not because we specifically chose them, but mm-hmm. because they're legit superstars um, and they're good yeah. at, extremely good at what they do. But yet people just try to keep on filling this artificial quota. Uh, so I, I just find that very fascinating. That's how they argue to attack you. But like imagine NBAs in sports. Right, right. They are mostly black men. Right. They don't ask for diversity of skin color there. <laughs> yeah, true, true. They don't. They don't yeah, say let's yeah. get Asian men play the basketball. They don't say that. Mm. So it's only when it's related to either white or male or then it that this that it, or Asian because you know Asian is in a privileged class. So it's only that that logic applies to those group of people. It's like it's like with the Harvard. Um, Right, right, yeah, yeah. Based on right, like based on actual test score, more than seventy percent of Harvard should be Asians. But then, uh, Harvard has a skin color quota. They only accepted the eleven percent of Asians. Yeah. Give twenty five percent of Latinos and twenty five percent African Americans and whites and like Jews like that. Based on that, their system actually Asians are systemically get discriminated right now in America. Yeah, but somehow it, we can never get discriminated because we are privileged school, right? Right. We are like white people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very uh, much of an inconvenient truth that you really Absolutely. just can't talk about, right? Because I yeah. never, never hear about, uh, let's say on CNN. I mean, I'm sure they cover the issue, but I don't really often hear about this on the mainstream, in the mainstream media. No, they don't cover it, actually. I did an actual study on this. Oh, really? They, they defend how Harvard is not being racist towards Asians. That's their, uh, even the court found that there is no racism against Asians and all these people have things to bring. And now they are attacking SAT and these uh, exams because Asians are exceptionally good at taking tests, not because they are cheating in the exam, but because they are studying a lot. Average yeah, longer they're, they're starting their group. asses off like the entire right. family <laughs> just like, right it's like yeah. it's such a big thing but then they say even the test is a racist how, how is taking a test how is taking a test racist because then you other groups don't do well on the test so, so it's you not gotta bring them. everybody else down in order to equalize everybody yeah but that is the definition of 
uh, socialism or communism, right? That's what they won. They won the do you not see AOC, America's most popular congresswoman. No, she no. is a democratic socialist, Alexandra Ocasio. Right, right, right. It's uh, Bernie Sanders, democratic socialist. But the thing is, they put the word democratic in the front, but still same thing. Governments control the means of production. They decide who gets what, what to produce. Still same ideology. Nothing about socialism that is democratic. Governments get all the control. But those people are biggest followers in America of the youth, the AOC and Bernie Sanders. I think young people, especially those like, you know, people in their early 20s that haven't experienced life and they have this like a, a sense of justice and they, they want everybody to be more equal. And, and it's, it's a very uh, passion driven type of ideology, I think. It's true. Like, you know, it's a, they, you can believe anything. They keep saying the paradise is possible. The utopia is possible. And they think we cannot have a utopia because of white supremacy and capitalism. So as long as we get rid of the capitalism and the U.S. government and then this constitution and white people, then we can get that utopia. So their ideology is so simple. Except there doesn't seem to be a, a, an alternative solution. If the only thing they're saying is just break everything down, but then what are they going to replace that with? Like socialism? Yeah. We build a system that is embodies this ideology of inclusion of diversity, where right. your merits don't matter. Only thing matters is your genetic facts, like who, your parents were like oppressed or not. You know, it's nothing to do that. I don't want to be a slave owner, but it doesn't matter because your ancestors did. Now, therefore, you're guilty and privileged. So there's no redemption in their ideology. That's what shocked me on North Korea is that. There's no redemption. No matter, I want to be so good to the party, like because of the, my ancestral crime, there's nothing I can change about my life. My children's fate is going to be exactly the same. Because in my speech, I said, before even I was born, my fate was determined for me. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, in America, that's what they're saying. So because you know, if my child is going to be Asian, then like that child is going to be forever viewed as a privileged group in America. They yeah. cannot change the perception because that's forever marking you yeah. as a privileged group. Yeah, actually, your 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 point reminds me of this conversation that I was having with other North Korean defector, oh. and he said something very interesting. Uh, that, like you said, Pyongyang, the capital mm. of North Korea, is its own fortress that nobody can just freely go in and out you need some sort of like a passport or something travel permit yeah travel right right permit, right, permit yeah. to go in and mm -hmm. out of different provinces right uh yeah. but the problem is in order to even go to pyongyang you have to have mm -hmm. like a super clear clean like family history in other words yeah. that nobody need nobody has to have like a, a criminal record or something like that the okay. problem is that every family usually yeah. tend to have either defector or during the great famine like because yeah. they're so hungry they steal something yeah. now they have a criminal record so right. pretty much everybody's a criminal that that they yeah. cannot really enter pyongyang that's a good example i think a good illustration of how because of what your great you know your grandfather he he literally didn't want to die so he stole a, a loaf of bread or something and because of that now you cannot go to yeah. pyongyang it's literally like it's a and that's the what it is like because your ancestors perhaps my own slaves or conquered other countries back then and but they don't even study the world history there were people arabs were invading europe right so now arabs can say we are oppressed you guys need to pay us reparation what you gonna do well before the natives americans what do they who were there before right. so let's go back all the way there then but there were there was a maybe little cell there. There was a little dust. Who owned that that place? You know? Where do you want to mark as a who owned this place? Mm -hmm. Like their ideologies makes no sense because they talk about like how I'm oppressed. So a lot of American African Americans are mixed nowadays, right? And then then what percent of your blood is oppressed and what percent of your blood is not oppressed? So let's calculate based on your blood percent, like let's calculate the reparation amount. This is like what's so sad about socialism. Like you don't build anything. You constantly complain about what's wrong in the world and you destroy. What's great about capitalism is people 
accept that world is not perfect, mm. that people mm. accept their problems to solve by innovating, mm. by building companies, mm. by creating things, by empowering individuals. But what socialists want to do is destroying, dismantling, mm. and bring people down, canceling mm. them. That is such a such a horrible, dangerous ideology. And that is getting through America, every corner in our society. Mm. And I think it's going to get to Asia, believe it or not. I think I see the signs nowadays more and more. I think uh, certainly the issue of feminism, or in, in the case of Korea, South Korea, uh, radical feminism, we hear it's a, it's a, uh, it's a rising issue. Uh, oh, really? This, like, like what, what's the examples? A conflict between genders, right? You know, how it becomes like a men versus women. Oh. And even recently, like, you know, you, you have a quota uh, for number of females to be need to be hired for like firefighters or, or you know, when you're like doing the, the, the test or exams for police officers or firefighters, like you need to have like a certain number of females which uh it's like uh and then i think probably the general public all they care about is their safety right i i want right. i want to i want to have a competent strong police officer to come and protect me or this brave firefighters to be strong and rescue somebody but you know now it's it just have to be about quota <laughs> so i think uh I think you might be right. The the ideology is slowly seeping into to more developed Asian countries. Um, don't know how to feel about that <laughs> yet, but yeah, you know. So then, what kind of hope do you have for your son? And five years old, yeah. Five years, wow. So what kind of what kind of world do you want him to live in? I mean, because now you cannot go anywhere else. You know, you're you're sort of where you need to be at. Because where else are you going to go from America, right? Exactly. I say Mar at the moon with Elon Musk, right? <laughs> You're going to start a new <laughs> colony there. <laughs> That's the only hope. Right. No, I mean, there's, I cannot imagine the world without America, with all its flaws. What this country stands for is truly inspiring. And what this country has achieved is a testament what humanity can achieve. It's a, I mean, they defeated Nazis. They defeated so many diseases and poverty and right of course it caused a lot of harm too but given that like it was perfect the world that i want my son is for is of course not the utopia perfect world there's no crime and nothing is bad but i guess i want him to be resilient what is lacking with the modern youth is they've never been gone hungry in their life even once mm -hmm. they've never actually experienced real hardship not even oppression like just real difficulty of life that for them, the biggest injustice is how little chickens have low like range. They are like, for them, this drives their mind crazy. Like, oh, little ducks, they cannot like this. Apparently, they take the down feather from little ducks. And then, like, we are wearing this warm jacket. And then my friends going on the street and putting pouring blood on their body. And then crying out for people's attention. Because for them... This has got to be the worst thing they've ever seen in their life is that the dogs getting killed for the, our jackets. They don't understand that human organs are harvested, millions of them in China in the concentration camp. They cannot comprehend that. So, you know, really raising a child can understand the true definition of oppression and how lucky that we are. We are living in this best country in the entire human history. It's not just in the contemporary world. What we are having in South Korea, America is literally the best we've ever had as a humanity. So get some real humanity education, mm. study the human history, what mm. we went through, how most of our lives we are starving and dying from rape and disease and so much stuff were killing us. And because of free market and capitalism, that we have even a place to complain about. Without capitalism, how do we even have an internet? Right, right. America would not exist. Then we would not invent the internet. It's an invention of capitalism. And the, without knowing that knowledge, people want to destroy that very ideology that is capitalism, the system. And they would lose everything. They have no clue what they're going to lose if they destroy America and free market. So do you, do you suggest that people should almost like voluntarily, uh, I mean, number one, they should be, you know, 
they should teach themselves some history mm -hmm. so that they yeah. actually understand that socialism, whether in principle or in mm -hmm. real life applications, I mean, because we've already tried that experiment many, many, many yeah. times. And 21 times. Oh, well, there you go. And yeah. people think, oh, no, 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 but that wasn't done properly. Only yeah. if it did it this way. But we're going to do better know. this time. Right, <laughs> Every right. single time. And that coupled with a, a certain sense of like self entitlement, because you know you feel like you're entitled to stuff without you even trying, uh, actually working hard. But then you know because you now live in a in a very prosperous country where even though there's a massive class divide, like a poor people getting poorer, richer people getting richer, the truth is that people are very comfortable in general, right? So in that environment, how do you teach people? important qualities like grit like you know perseverance and not you know like actually you know coming across some hardships because it's all relative what you know what you just talked about the animal rights and and all that pie stuff for them it might actually feel very very painful because that's all they know right so do you propose that people expose themselves to like a harsher environment on purpose like no. like maybe go go travel or something like that I mean, sometimes some of these people are telling me how much they hate America. I want to ship them to North Korea and then bring North Koreans out instead, right? That's like the ideal world. Be perfect. Right. Humans are amazing creatures. Like we are capable of abstract thinking. You know, we are logical beings. Unlike mm -hmm. animals, we have amazing way of communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a book about... So I forgot this book was talking about how we are different than other, other animals. We can tell each other stories, mm. right? The animals are like, okay, I saw there's one lion. Okay, don't go there. Maybe that's it. Mm. But we're going to talk about the under the stars with this breeze. And if you're going to, our ability is a very different thing. I think that it comes down to even what you do or what I do is, you know, one responsibility that I can think of myself having for my, for the next generation is transferring the knowledge they we had to them so they can build up from that stage mm -hmm. if we cannot let them the all the knowledge that we understood the loss in them and that's why brainwashing in universities or schools are very dangerous because we are not educating them we are actually brainwashing them mm -hmm. and i think one thing we can do is fixing the education system and as a parents we should be alert that we need to watch out what they are learning at school you know having conversation with them like what do you think about the world like you literally taking phone away from the kids, stop letting them playing the video games and going on TikTok and Instagram, mm -hmm. useless, this mind numbing, like end of civilization things. Like let them read some books. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I so I was so shocked how many people do not read books these days. Yeah, I don't think people I mean in Korea I think people definitely read a lot more because you know there are like bookshops everywhere. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've, I've noticed that also in, in, in the Western traditional Western environment, people don't tend to read a lot. Yeah, they don't. And they say something crazy number 80% of the people do not read more than after one chapter, even after buying the book. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a level of like most of kids nowadays, not most, like a lot of public school kids in America, when they graduate from high school, they cannot read. Their reading comprehension skills are so low. They cannot do the basic math. They cannot wow. do the basic reading comprehension. Oh, that that's 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 pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess your son's kind of lucky to have a uh, have a mom like you, huh? <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, actually, you know, one thing that I was kind of wondering is like you are a single mom, right? Oh, how do they find? Uh, we are divorced, but we are co-parenting our right, child. Right, right, right. Okay. So okay. he's involved in the child life. We are like 50-50 custody. I don't know. I see, when I you're see. saying single mom is like where dad is gone and then you are yeah, raising yeah, kids by enough. yourself. So you're not really single mom in that sense that you no. guys are co-parenting. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. Like, yeah, half half. But how important do you think uh, it is for a child to have a... Uh, uh like a like a father like a fatherly presence very important thing i think really i could have i was divorcing my ex-husband when my child was very young like three or just mm. passing two right 
Right. And I could be easily arguing for full custody. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women do. Mm -hmm. So when children are young, they want their mother and they fight for full custody. And that's mm -hmm. very common. And that's what most people were suggesting to me too. Like it's, the court is not, you know, let you have it because I'm not some drug addict and not a responsible mother. I'm a pretty responsible person. But I, of course, studied a lot of child development and even Jordan Peterson talks about it, you know. The best scenario is for a child to grow up in a family that is nuclear family, mother and father is in existence. But if you can't do that, you need to be both equally involved in the child's life. Mm. And I think that's why I was not fighting for the full custody and letting him have half of the week. Even it's very tough. It's child is young. They need a mother more, I think, at this mm. age. But still, I think having that father figure in the life, it gives a better role model and they learn how to become a man eventually through that yeah. image. Yeah, I really believe that men has as important role to play to raising a life as women, as, as mothers do. I guess one of the reasons why I'm asking you that question uh, is because another concept that we hear often uh, in the West, especially from the US, is this whole idea of toxic masculinity and you know how men are like i mean you mentioned white men but i guess in that category there are also men that seem to just get vilified for pretty much everything these days but is that is that right or like what's your what's your observation like uh my professor were telling me so why don't you do the social experiment the fact that when men hold the door for the lady do you know what that means to this liberal educated uh, American Ivy League school students? Means that he's being courteous, he's being thoughtful, uh, he's just trying to be polite. Right. Now that's a sign of oppression. They try to overpower you, show who is in control. That I'm strong, that I can I'm holding this door for you to oppress you. Who sorry, sorry, who said that? <laughs> My professor. So your, your Columbia professor. Yeah. That's like that's why men can never do wrong or bad or good these days. How you look, how you breathe, how you can stand, your presence is toxic in some ways. Like a guy that you try to explain something, they call it mansplaining. I, I heard that. I heard that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if guys to try to do something, oh, you're gaslighting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's a you tr try to open the door for the lady you are trying to overpower her by like showing your power that's very oppressive it's it's tough it's tough to be a man <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what to say <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. It's, you, you should be at least grateful that you are not a white guy you know that you got the worst <laughs> i mean that's very hard life these days <laughs> Um, I guess the reason why uh, I mention all these uh, strong male, almost like a role models, having having a male role model being important. Um, the reason why I asked we talk we're talking about this is because I understand from your book that you also had a very special bond with your father, who's no longer with you. But how would you describe the relationship you had with your father? I didn't see him a lot of my life because when I was like eight, nine, he was sent to prison camp and he came out after three years. And then when he came out, we, I had to escape to China. So, but even those not that many days of spending together, it's one thing that he taught me was how life was precious, how life was worth fighting for, even as a slave life, you know, it's, dying was the easiest thing I had like choosing to die was the easiest option that I had dying takes only like five minutes leaving takes forever it's a very hard thing to do when you are in that such a kind of situation and if he didn't tell me the how precious life was I don't think I would have kept going mm -hmm. and he showed with his example he fought for his life until the last breath he had so it's a history to this day, my hero. And and it also helped me to later forgive men. I couldn't like, because first guy I saw in China was rapist, raping my mother, raping me. And I thought all the men were just horrible. They were like worse than animals. And how can you not be? Because any guy I saw was a rapist. And coming to America and thinking about that, my father was also a man and he was, 
he loves me very much. So understanding that and try to understand the context. I think what's lost in current America is I'm sure there's some bad men and bad women like too, but they try to generalize it and simplify everything and saying that everything that men do is like toxic and evil. So if your dad was still alive today and he was with you, what would you tell him after having gone through so much? Oh, I don't know. I never thought about it. I don't even think he would approve me of me doing what I do because uh, like even when I started becoming an uh, outspoken like person, my mom literally thought I was like out of my mind. Mm. <laughs> That's why she literally said, I told her, mom, I want to like be a human rights activist. And she was like, are you out of your mind? And as you know, like most of human rights careers are very hungry career, like artists. Mm. Most of them don't make it very struggling. You get so many attacks, and especially going after North Korean regime in China. It's like very dangerous thing. I don't know if my father would be like allowing me to be this public and this vulnerable. Maybe he would have wanted me to have a private, safe life. Would you say you're happy today? Yeah, I am very happy because of him. I think uh, the confidence that he gave to me as a child, that his unconditional love set me up, preparing me today, no matter what the people say, no matter what the world says, if a child loves from their parents truly, they will never question them, their worth. That's the thing about parents' unconditional love, that that child will always carry that love and confidence with them and the happiness because we don't need anybody's approval. And I think that's what he did for me. I got the confidence because of him that he never questions questioned my worth. And a lot of... Asian dads do. They compare their children to other children. You know, in North Korea, beating was a very common disciplinary method. Mm. But somehow he was very exceptional that he never did that. I think uh, you still have a lot more to accomplish. And I, and I really, <laughs> uh, I think that wholeheartedly, I, I you know, agree and admire uh, your vision of, of what kind of future you want for those poor women who are still in slavery or even even if it's like raising your son to be a capable young man uh, in this modern world. But, you know, you definitely have your work cut out for you, I feel like. Oh, thank you so much. I, I hope it's not a too controversial for you. Now you're going to be marked as a right-wing Nazi, just like me and Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan. <laughs> so welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's kind of interesting what you told me before we started this conversation that you somehow thought that we are like a very uh, left leaning liberal uh, type of thing. But we honestly just want to talk to everybody. That's a you problem. Know? They don't want you to talk to everybody because <laughs> people like me have no right to speak. Right, My speech is a violence to them. That's their ideology. And so like even Lex Friedman, right? even Joe Rogan. That's he got into trouble because he wanted to talk to everybody. He was curious to talk yeah. to everybody. Yeah. And they don't like that. They don't want to give a platform to people like a disagrees with their ideology. Mm -hmm. Actually, what was it like meeting, you know, Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson? And they're obviously one of the most influential, you know, podcasters and thought leaders in the world. Uh, what was it like meeting them in person? Very chill people, very yeah. humble. You, it's a one thing that I got connected to Dr. Peterson is, uh, I was, I think I had a lot of questions and we, like, we had a podcast, but then mm. like meeting in person over like food, mm. you know, he was actually eating pure meat diet. You mm. heard about his special diet yes, yes. and his wife too. And I was really amazed how much his uh, life were coming from spirituality. Mm -hmm. And one thing that he told me that stuck with me was, I live as if God is real. And even if you don't believe that God is real, if you believe that God is real, you are going to live life of a more moral and responsible way. There is right and wrong. And the problem in the West right now, there's no more right and wrong. Anything is okay. It's anarchy, right? It shouldn't of yourself with the heroin on the street, that's fine. It's a freedom. 
Like we got complete anarchy in America. But having that moral compass is very important. And we need to find the moral compass, maybe not in church or Christianity or mm. Buddhism, anything, but somehow we all need to come up with that meaning in life. So you're talking about uh, Jordan Peterson and how about Joe Rogan? What was it like meeting Joe Rogan? So I was very scared because uh, <laughs> I have seen some of his interviews and Joe is like you, like very independent. He's not controlled by any institution. And I have seen him like pushing people, you know, like asking them, testing them, like, do you actually know about this? You know, in a very gentle way. So a lot of my friends were like, he doesn't push you back a lot. <laughs> Are you ready for it? So I went into thinking it's going to be a very difficult interview. But he was just so cheer Southern guy, like in te- from Texas. He was living in Texas, Austin. Right. And uh, they showed me their like bar area in the kitchen, all their whiskeys are. Of course, I didn't drink. <laughs> and <laughs> he he makes sure that like nobody's around during the interview. So it's very intimate, just like two people sitting, just like chatting. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I remember like he said, we are done with the interview. It was like three hours and a half. It just gone by so quickly. Yeah. It was a like quite an experience. And what does it sort of like say? What does that say about the current state of uh, the media right now? When all these individuals that you're talking about and just being able to have real conversations with these people versus what you see on the the mainstream news, it just feels so different, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, they say how they are racist and bigots. Right, <laughs> they are all demonized in the mainstream media, and when you go meet those people, you like I've never met people who are that open and that tolerant. Mm. And so it's it's like a North Korean government like broadcasting everything they say is lie at this point, and American mainstream media became so corrupt. You know, even though Trump was the person who announced that the the American mainstream media is like an enemy of the people. <laughs> Back then, I thought, like, he's the soul sensationalist. What is he talking about? And now I see, like, they're making all these innocent people as a racist and bigots because those people are not agreeing with their political correctness. And, like, they are just, like, real humans. So I think eventually American traditional media going to go down because people are not interested in lies anymore. They want the real thing. So... I really, in some way, think it's a good sign that people are responding to this like three hours podcast, you know, like listening to something that is not visually edited at all, just sitting through two people talking through Zoom, they watch it. It's really remarkable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what's next for you? Uh, what do you have plans? I know you have your book coming out. You know, I think we covered some aspects of the book, but, you know, I, I've read it. Uh, it was oh. actually really uh, eye-opening, and uh, it would be nice to get a signed copy at some point, and oh, also be able so to uh, to catch up uh, in person as well. So, yeah, our goal, at least being based in Asia, is that we really want to play that bridging role between the way people think in the West and in Asia, because I think you would know this, but in Asia, besides North Korea, there are still a lot of... Uh, you know, authoritarian re- regimes and, you know, people right. still don't have the sense of freedom. So for me, it was at least very eye-opening to hear from your perspective how like this type of censorship and you, you now almost like don't really seem to have that much freedom in some aspects. Mm-hmm. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, I think it's a, it teaches us about the fragility of freedom. Mm-hmm. And if we are not being vigilant, we can lose it at any moment. And America is not an exception. Like who thought the definition of freedom was America, right? The symbol of freedom, individual liberty was freedom. And even in this country, now those freedoms are going away. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a waking up call all around the world, people really, if we stop fighting for freedom, that we can lose it. And this is a, freedom has a very high price. Many, many people die for it and they still don't get it. I think this is where people don't understand. Somehow, if we die for freedom, you're going to get it. It's never guaranteed. Look at the countries like China. There are millions of people protesting are not free. And they may never get free. Who knows, right? So why we have freedom, we need to protect it before we lose it. 
like your life's mm. mission, I think, is to mm. do all you can to raise awareness about the sex slavery that's going on mm -hmm. in China, as you said. Uh, yeah. How bad is the situation right now? And what can people do to be helpful? So situation is very dire because, uh, as I said, the reason people are not escaping from North Korea is not because situation gotten better. It just the security border security got so tighter that nobody can escape. Mm -hmm. And in in China especially, they with I like AI recognitions and the officials got such a tight security that so they became a police state. China is becoming police state every day and becoming like North Korea, but with a high advanced technology assistance with them. And uh, because of that, I think it's getting harder and harder to rescue North Korean defectors. But despite that, as you know, there are nonprofits that based in South Korea, America, still rescue North Korean defectors here and there. And there are nonprofits that are sending uh, USB thumb drives through Chinese border to smuggle information inside North Korea. So telling North Korean people that the outside world, free world exists, that they can be like us. And lastly, of course, we need a campaign, uh, write a letter to our congressmen, to our senators, and to our teachers, our friends, to let the world know that this modern day Holocaust is happening. This slavery never ended. It's continuing. There was never a time in human history this many people were enslaved than even before. This is a time when most people are enslaved and people do not do not know about it because the mainstream media don't talk about it. Or the reason is that most of these modern day slave, slaves are held by in China. There are internment camps for the Xinjiang like Uyghurs, the Muslims. There are many other people in, North, in Chinese prison camps, not just North Koreans. And their organs are harvested out. It's an international crisis, not just North Korean problem. So if we can fight together, I do think that we have a chance to push back this evil regime. And I think that's what I want people to do. Mm -hmm. To join these nonprofits, I'm working with the Human Rights Foundation. They sponsor North Korean uh, NGOs to get the information in. There is a other NGOs called No Chain. And now in South Korea, they can join them. And just Google like North Korean NGOs on Google, you, you even pop up, you can see their mission and join their work. And because you're now based there and now thanks to your high, uh, like very visible public profile, I'm sure you actually talk to a lot of famous people and influential people in private gatherings about this uh, sex slavery issue. And so far to date, what's been their response? You know, because you, you write in your book that you mention all these like <coughs> parties that you go to or conferences and then you talk to like, you know, some big names. Were they were they helpful or not really? As a friend, they are very helpful. They all say, oh, like, I, I, I'm sorry what you went through, but publicly there's nothing I can do mm. because of their relationship, their dependence on China. And the hypocrisy of these elites is that on the surface, they are saying they are fighting against injustice. They, they do not believe in slavery. They believe that silence is a violence, right? This is their thing they say, like silence is violence. We need to stand up for BLM protest and gender equality, but not for other people. It's when it's only convenient, they want to fight for human rights. And what really matters is when it's inconvenient, like Martin Luther King Jr. was a part, they fought for civil liberty when that was high risk involved, when they could get killed. And that's what real courage means. That's how actually changing the world means. When things are actually very inconvenient and hard, that's when we need to stand up and have courage to fight for these voiceless people. Not when it's just like easy to do it. Right now you can say, oh, I, I support gay people. Well, why didn't you say that in the 80s and 70s when you were being penalized for that? Mm -hmm. Now you say that is not a courage. That's just in a virtue signaling. Right, right. It's almost like fashionable to say that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like that's fashionable, but there's no risk of doing that. And now saying I support the North Korean people, I denounce Chinese Communist Party. It comes with a lot of risk. 
And that's how we actually test people's actual character and what they actually believe in. Well, Yummy, uh, you know, it's a pleasure having you on and to be able to have this long form chat. You know, anybody who always thinks of a bigger purpose uh, to focus on other than just, you know, doing something for themselves has my respect. I, I would love to recommend this book, your new book to uh, quite a few friends of mine. I'll be, you know, buying Aww. copies for them. So, you know, I hope that <laughs> your, your book uh, sells many copies. <laughs> oh, and then, thank uh, you so much. And then hope that we can uh, one day catch up in person. Yeah, thank time. you everyone for your heart. Thank you, Stephen. Have a good night.